Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, Jarka Glassi, I'm the current Vice President of the European Federation of Chemical Engineers, EFCE. And as the picture in the background shows, I actually work at Newcastle University. I'm a professor in the School of Engineering, and my background is actually biochemical engineering, but it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce this webinar on multi-phase flow, but specifically on population balance modeling. And as we've discussed with presenters, for myself as a biochemical engineer, this is actually something of real interest because we do a lot of modeling and advanced modeling techniques in our own work. So it's amazing how these kind of tools translate across the various aspects of chemical and biochemical engineering. Let me just say a few words about the webinar series and I'll not hold you too long, but it's worth reflecting on this being the third year of webinars that EFC is running. As we talked this morning, there was something positive that came out of the pandemic and it was this introduction of webinar series for us, EFC, to give our members an opportunity to get together and exchange ideas and, and discuss scientific topics. And um, this year, so these two weeks, this week and next week, eight of our technical groups, that's working parties and sessions, We'll be delivering um, short talks on very focused topics, and uh, these will be delivered by a mixture of industrialists and academics, as we will see today. And we found that the seminars were, or the webinars were so successful that the leadership of EFC decided that we will continue with these series and we'll try to deliver two sets of webinars each year if we can, because we believe that they allow our membership and those interested sample matters in the areas that may not naturally attract them to a physical conference if we ever get to go to the physical conferences these days and encourage them to cross fertilize across fields as we've discussed this morning with um, our chair Mikhail. Just to let you know, the you would have heard the warning, the webinar is recorded and the recording will be available both on the EFC website and also on the EFC official YouTube channel. And then just a few quick words about EFC, if you don't know anything about our organization yet. So EFC promotes scientific collaboration and supports the work of chemical engineers in 30 European countries, which brings together something like over 100,000 chemical engineers in those areas. And I mentioned the working parties and sections that we have, and these are really the, the scientific hub of all of our activities activities and they drive many of the EFC activities that you will see and they provide an important forum for technical exchange and networking among chemical engineers in Europe. So I don't want to hold you too long because you've got a really interesting program I'm going on, but I would just really like to thank all the people in the working parties, particularly in this case, the uh, working party that we're talking about, so multi uh, flow, uh, and in particular, um, our colleague Martin Fu from Toulouse, who organizes all these webinars um, for us. So thank you very much, Martin. All that hard work is very much appreciated. And all that remains is just to wish you a very successful and fruitful webinar and all the best for the future. And I'll hand over now to our chair today, Michael Schuller and Schutter, and uh, let him take over and run the webinar for us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jakar. And uh, welcome to all of you to our webinar today. My name is Michael Schlüter. I'm the chair of the uh, working party on uh, multiphase uh, fluid flow. And uh, I'm very happy to have uh, so many participants today to our working uh, party um, um, webinar today. And uh, yeah, uh, this uh, webinar was the initiative uh, actually of uh, two uh, members of the working party of uh, uh, Frederic Augier and uh, also Alain Linné, and uh, we discussed this in our annual meeting uh, last uh, year, 
that it uh, might be useful to bring all these uh, points uh, together from industry and academia and to, to see what is the actual status on population balance uh, modeling. Because I guess uh, all of uh, us uh, know that uh, it makes no sense to do any modeling or calculation of mass transfer performance, for example, or of uh, fluid dynamics in multi-phase flows if we don't need, if we don't know the uh, particle size distributions of bubbles, droplets, or solids. And uh, so uh, we decided let's go in the direction. In the meanwhile, we might have the opportunities with uh, numerical simulations and with new measurement techniques to get uh, deeper insights into uh, particle size distributions. And the question is, is it really useful to put all together particles, bubbles, uh, droplets, and uh, where are the needs on, on industry? And uh, from this point of view, I'm extremely happy that uh, we got the question um, this uh, uh, spring from uh, Julia Hofinger from the BSF company to uh, Frederic Oyer uh, to do some initiatives in this uh, direction. And so we decided to have this uh, seminar first and uh, to see um, what kind of contributions uh, can we get together and we are extremely happy to have so many participants uh, today and we are looking forward to uh, uh, yeah, nice presentations and also fruitful discussions. And uh, so I guess uh, we have uh, quite a nice uh, program. We have uh, uh, speakers from France, from uh, Italy and uh, from Germany. And uh, we will start with a presentation um, from uh, Frederic Oyer from uh, EFP Energy Nouvelle from uh, Lyon. We have a, afterwards, uh, we have a presentation from uh, industry. So Julia Hofinger from the BSF company will give us uh, some uh, hints about uh, demands in industry and what is necessary to come to more reliable uh, scale up and uh, uh, and design of uh, multi-phase reactors. And then we will have a, a short bio break of uh, 10 minutes at uh, 10.40. And uh, afterwards, we will uh, continue with a presentation from uh, the school of Daniel Machizo from, from Italy about numerical simulations of uh, pop in population balance uh, modeling. And uh, afterwards, uh, we have a presentation from France again, from Martin Obligado, and he will give us some insights into uh, recent uh, measurement opportunities and uh, to, to see uh, what we can do to find uh, data for the validation of numerical simulations. And at about uh, 11.50, we would like to go into a discussion with you um, to see uh, where are further demands, where are further opportunities, what should we do in future, and is there opportunity to create a kind of network uh, of the participants and maybe further uh, working parties to go forward in this uh, very important topic. Because as I mentioned before, we will never be able to calculate mass transfer performances in multi-phase flows and fluid dynamics if we, don't able, if, if we are not able to predict particle size distributions. So it's e extremely important. And uh, yeah, we will end with final remarks at 12.30. Uh, and uh, I hope all of you will um, uh, enjoy the, uh, this uh, webinar today. For your questions, please uh, write the questions in the chat because unfortunately it's not possible to talk with each other directly. It's a little bit uh, uh, yeah, sad, but uh, this is a format uh, today. And uh, so please write the questions in the chat. I will read the, the questions and uh, then uh, we can uh, answer and discuss them. And uh, if uh, we are not able to answer all the questions, uh, then uh, don't worry. I will try to answer the questions even at the next talk or even our uh, lecturers can answer these questions during the next uh, talk. So all your questions will be answered, um, I'm quite sure. Okay, if there are no further questions or comments, then I would like to start uh, directly with our first presentation. And this will be given by uh, Frederic Oyer from uh, EFP uh, Energy Nouvelle in uh, Lyon. Frederic, we are very happy to uh, hear your presentation. You are both, right, academia and industry as well. And so it's extremely interesting um, to see uh, what are your uh, insights uh, into the population balance uh, modeling questions. So please, uh, the screen is yours. Yes, thank you, Michel. Uh, so I show the screen. Uh, do you see the, the, the full screen? 
still or no it's not full screen right oh, now maybe wait. you can switch to full screen yes. mode should be good now yes perfect yeah. okay hi everyone uh so i'm frederic Augier, and uh i would like to thanks first uh organizers and michelle of course for uh, this proposal to give me uh, an opportunity to present this work uh, i'm going to talk about uh, bubble size measurements and population balance modeling in the flows with a special focus on the consideration of um, complex or uh, more representative uh, physical properties of grids. Uh, and the part of this work is uh, picked out from collaborations with academic partners of LEGI or Polito and uh, Sigma laboratories with uh, different PhDs we had together. And also other parts of the presentation are uh, more new results coming from uh, works here at, uh, at AFP. So this is the, the summary of our presentation. I will uh, shortly introduce uh, the, the motivation we have uh, here at AFP to work on this topic and uh, the methods we have uh, used in terms of uh, measurements of the bubbles and also uh, modeling. And uh, then I will uh, present two, uh, two applications of population balance modeling. The first is bubble currents and second is tiered points, uh, higher rated state patterns. I will, finish with, I will finish with some concluding remarks. So, as you said, Michael, at uh, IFP, we are uh, somewhere uh, in between academic uh, labs and uh, industry, and we, we develop processes, and uh, we try to do research for that. And uh, the finality is to develop processes in different uh, fields of industry. Uh, now we work more on uh, green chemistry and biofuels and uh, decarbonation and, uh, and so on, uh, recycling of the plastics and, and so on. So uh, we have different applications of bubbly flows, especially in green chemistry. Uh, we work on fish oil synthesis, oligomerization, and uh, also for biofuels. We have big bioreactors to design, to produce enzyme. And uh, of course, we, we have there is also a lot of application of bubbly flows uh, out of uh, IFP in many, many industries. Uh, we are interested by many, many technologies of double double flows, double columns, tiered tanks, jet loops. And uh, in any case, we, we know that, uh, we all know that uh, bubble size is very uh, important to consider because it has a very strong impact on many aspects of the, of the behavior of the reactors, starting by the gas or dot because of the effect of the bubble size on the slip velocity. And uh, if we are wrong on the prediction of gazelle dot, we can be wrong on the residence time of liquid and uh, make a strong, uh, strong error on the, on, the, on the prediction of conversion of fractions. Also, uh, depending on the bubble size, it can uh, have an effect on the hydrodynamics and mixing, shear stress in the, in the reactors or by reactors. can change a lot the behavior of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the reactors or by reactors. And of course, if we have limitation of mass transfer uh, for some uh, fast reactions, uh, any, uh, any change of bubble size will uh, modify the interfacial area and modify the, the conversion in the reactors. So for all these reasons, uh, it's essential to have a uh, possibility to predict uh, bubble size in the reactor. Uh, when we are on uh, development of processes, of course, we don't have the reactors to to measure bubbles inside, we just have pilot, pilot reactors, but hydrodynamics is not uh, the one we will have after at, uh, at our scale. So we can use correlation or we can use also uh, cold flow mockups. But in this case also, we have a mistake. We don't use uh, the good uh, fluid properties. So the bubble size are not, are not uh, well uh, measured also. So uh, we, 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 we believe, and uh, we are, I think, all here because we believe that population balance is a promising tool for uh, scale up and design of reactors because it could help us to bridge uh, real hydrodynamics with uh, uh, with uh, fluid properties uh, in the industrial uh, reactors. Uh, a few words on uh, measurement methods because uh, anyway, if we uh, if we want to uh, validate uh, population balance, we need we need uh, experimental data for that. Uh, we can use photograph, but with many limitations, especially if the camera is outside the vessel. When we have uh, more than a few percent of gas, we will just see the bubbles at the wall. 
uh, we will not see the, the double size inside the bulk of the liquid. Uh, we can use endoscopic method. It's a little bit better, of course, uh, but fastidious, not so easy to, uh, auto, to, to automatize, to, to, to have a fast image processing, so it can be uh, complex to do. Uh, something very classical is also to use optical probes, like dual probes or multiple probes or conical probes. Uh, a lot of uh, these methods assume almost uh, vertical trajectories in the, in the double flows. So this can be uh, a limitation when we are uh, turbulent in the heterogeneous regime. Uh, and for this reason, uh, we have developed a few years ago in collaboration with, uh, with uh, the, the LEGI, Alain Cartelier, during the PhD of uh, Pedro Maximo Remundo, we have developed a new method based on the cross correlation method based on the, um, the statistical approach, based on the cross-correlation between two probes, but with no assumption on the double uh, trajectory. We, we just uh, measure statistics on the presence of doubles uh, at, the, at these two probes. And uh, by doing that, we have a, a good measurement of the uh, sorter diameter. We don't measure the bubble size distribution, which is a, a strong limitation of this method, but we have a good, a good, a good measurement of the, of the sorter diameter. Also, this, this, this probe are fragile. Uh, we cannot use it in presence of solid. Uh, this is also a weakness of this, of this method. And uh, this is a method we have used in the two applications I will present uh, after. Of course, depending on the future developments and our present developments, we will be happy to use new, new probes, like the Doppler probes that uh, will be presented by, uh, by Martin uh, this morning uh, after, after my presentation. Uh, now, uh, concerning uh, modeling, uh, if we talk about station balance, we, we often talk also about CFD modeling because uh, both are often uh, coupled. Uh, as we use here uh, CFD to, uh, to, to scale up reactors, uh, we, we can have billions of bubbles. So the only framework we can use here is a uh, steady runs two fluid models. Uh, we cannot use uh, other. Uh, let's say more uh, or, uh, other, other uh, approach with a better resolution like LUS DNAs. Here we just use Rans 2 fluid model and uh, we know that it is just something like a solver in fact and all the physics is inside the uh, uh, closure, uh, closure laws like interfacial uh, forces, especially drag law. We have uh, worked a lot on, on, the, on, this, on this part and also uh, selection of the turbulent modeling uh, to include or not the double induced turbulent and what is the RAMS model to use. It's something, it's something very important because uh, after, once we couple CFD with uh, population balance, any change of uh, turbulence model can change the dissipation rate and modify the result of the, of the PBM. Uh, so, uh, before to use PBM, the idea is to, uh, to, 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 put, to, to, uh, to get a bubble, bubble diameter as an input parameter coming from correlation of measurements. And uh, of course, the objective would be to, uh, to have more full uh, predictive uh, models with uh, uh, coupling with PBM. Whatever, whatever the, the coupling method, in fact, we can uh, imagine a direct uh, coupling inside the CFD model or indirect by uh, iteration, separate iteration between CFD and PBM using, uh, for example, a multi zone approach and, and so on. So this is the framework of our modeling. Uh, as I'm the first to talk about PBM, I have just to present very quickly the method we, we use for PBM resolution. Uh, here at IFP and in my division, we don't use a full, full population balance resolution on the multi-class uh, with the, all the classes of the bubbles. We, we don't need to do that because we just measure, uh, in fact, uh, total diameter. So anyway, we should not be able to validate the double size distribution we solve. And also, as we use a two fluid model and uh, only uh, one phase is transported for the gas, all the bubbles are transported together, whatever their size. Their size. So for these reasons, we don't need to solve double size distribution. And uh, anyway, it would be very expensive in time of uh, security time. So we use the QMOM um, approach, quadratic method of uh, moments, uh, which is completely sufficient for us. And it's rather cheap because it only increases uh, the two fluid simulations by, uh, by 20% approximately of uh, uh, security time, uh, in addition of the normal calculation without, without PDM. 
Sorry. Um, so the, the idea of this approach is uh, to just solve the six first problems of the double size uh, distribution and uh, to do it by using the quadrature uh, approximation. And if we use the moments two and three, I'm very sorry about that. Um, if we use the moments two and three, we can easily calculate the, the, the Sauter diameter uh, present anywhere in the simulation. So, sorry. And there's, do you see the full screen or not? Yes, I think it's. No, oh, it's uh, not the presentation mode anymore. I, I'm very sorry because my, my phone is. Uh, uh, is it okay now? Uh, yes, now you're okay, in the presentation I'm sorry. mode. Again. Thank you. Uh, so, the, so, the method is based on the reconstruction of a three node distribution at each time step from the six moments. We can uh, calculate three uh, size of bubbles that are used then calculate the breakage and coalescence phenomena, and that are used to predict the source term of the um, transport equation of the different moments. And this method has been validated uh, many times in many papers, uh, especially by uh, Fox and Martillo, and it works well to predict the moments of the, the PSD. So to calculate the Sauter diameter, it's, it's completely sufficient for us. The physics underlying these models are, uh, are well known. You have the breakage frequency, which is a model uh, 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 called G, G uh, breakage frequency. You have the coalescence frequency model, which is uh, divided on the, the collision frequency and the coalescence efficiency. And another part, another uh, model important is the model of the daughter size distribution. So the distribution of bubbles after breakage of the bigger bubble. All these models of breakage and coalescence um, involve physical properties of the fluids and hydrodynamics like gas fraction and dissipation rate. And you can solve it in CFD, or you can also solve it in, in the zero D model associate if you uh, give uh, gas hold up and uh, dissipation rate to, to, to use for the for the population balance model. The, the scheme of the resolution is uh, this one. Uh, very quickly, you start from the moments of the distribution in zero to one five. You use it with a quadrature approximation to reconstruct a possible distribution of three of three bubbles, and these three bubbles are used to solve the source term of the different uh, transport equation of the moment uh, k, uh, k from uh, 0 to, to 5. And, and after uh, iteration, you can uh, follow the, uh, the evolution of the different moments everywhere in the simulation. So I will not say more, more about that, but you see the, how it works. Uh, for the first case of application is double columns now. And um, before to talk about population balance modeling, uh, we have to talk a little bit about CFD a model we used before, because if the CFD model is wrong, of course, the PDM cannot uh, run well. Uh, we, we focus on, on the turbulent flows and hot heterogeneous regimes because um, at industrial, uh, on industrial applications, often we have high, high gas fraction, like 10 to 40% of gas, and it was more or less uh, a rather unknown. Uh, Unknown uh, uh, regime in terms of population balance modeling. And this was the topic of the PhD of uh, Luca Gemello between uh, Polito and uh, IFP. We have uh, selected some closure laws like uh, drag law and uh, turbulence models that uh, works well to predict the hydrodynamics without PDM, just by using the, the good the good bubble size we have measured separately. And as you see here, this model. Uh, is able to predict well the evolution of the gas hold up uh, for different uh, VSG and also uh, profiles of uh, gas hold up and profiles of liquid velocity. Uh, as we had uh, satisfying results on the on the hydrodynamics, we, we we make the coupling and Luca made the coupling with a PDM, and he found good kernels of um, breakage and coalescence to to predict the bubble size. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, heterogeneous regimes, we found that the good kernel was to use the model of Lapinen uh, for breakage, which you have here, the model of Wang uh, for the collision frequency, and uh, he tried to use film drainage models for collision efficiency, but it failed uh, any time, 
we finally decided we finally decided to use a more empirical model, which is the model of flair based on the ratio between the critical velocity, which is a constant, and the relative velocity, which is calculated from the turbulence model. And with this kernel, uh, he had very good results on water air system. Uh, as you can see here, he's able to, to predict well the bubble size, the average bubble size in the, the bubble columns, whatever the, the VSG, and also along uh, an axial, uh, axial position, a vertical position in the column. And uh, for different uh, VSG and inside different columns, he found also good prediction of the profiles of bubble size uh, of bubble diameters uh, in the column. He predicted well also uh, the fact that we have bigger bubbles at the middle of the column compared to the to the to the to the, to the wall position uh, closer to the wall. So, has it worked well for air water uh, systems? The question was okay, but is this kernel able to predict? What's happening if we have more uh, realistic uh, systems? I mean, uh, less less coalescing systems, for example, as we have in, uh, in industry. And we tested two different systems. We tested the uh, water with addition of ethanol that does not change the, the surface tension, but it changes the coalescence. And we tested also some different organic liquids. Uh, I will not present all the data, but uh, we, uh, we have uh, tested heptane, nitrogen, uh, System at different pressures, for, for instance. And what we have found is that, of course, all these uh, fluids uh, generate smaller bubbles, as you can see here, compared to water in gray. If we use uh, addition of ethanol or if we use, if we use uh, organic liquids, we have smaller bubbles. Uh, and uh, the question was to see if the population balance was able to predict that. And uh, if we use the same kernel with no change of the critical velocity, uh, it does not work uh, well especially for the uh, water with ethanol system, because if we have no modification of the uh, physical properties, of course, the model cannot uh, modify results and we, we cannot predict well this, this case. And also for the organic liquids, we see that the, the, the continuous lines that represent the CFD to scrimmon simulations, continuous lines all over predict the bubble size. So we, we see that from this first uh, comparison that the, uh, Coalescence is probably probably uh, uh, overestimated, and we have to we have to change uh, the coefficients, the fitting coefficient, and uh, we tried to modify the critical velocity, and we found that if we decrease this critical velocity, uh, we we have much better results, and now we have good prediction of the water plus ethanol system, and also good prediction of heptane at uh, ambient pressure. If we look at the Bubble size uh, in heptane under pressure, we see that we still have a gap. Probably we would need to increase or uh, decrease a little bit more uh, the critical velocity. So I would say it's a pragmatic uh, solution, uh, can help for engineers, but uh, it's not satisfying because uh, we still don't really understand why uh, why we have to change this value uh, of the critical velocity. Is it physical? And we still need to make the bridge between, uh, yes. Uh, Physical properties on this uh, on this coefficient that we, what we change empirically. The, the second application is now uh, based on stirred tanks. Uh, for the for same reasons, we, we worked a lot on stirred tanks because we, we use them for bioreactors. And as uh, there are only two studies uh, related in the uh, literature uh, concerning double size measurements, I uh, rather high gas fraction. We had this PhD of uh, Vincenzo Capello. Um, he, he, he measured double size in many configurations of uh, shared tanks and also uh, in different fluids like water and also aqueous systems with surfactants and also with non newtonian fluids. But I will not talk about this part today. Uh, we validate the measurement of uh, double size uh, by comparison with endoscopic uh, method. And then we use the cross correlation method uh, in time. And we observe two zones of uh, double size. Double size we observe were approximately homogeneous in the tank, anywhere, excepted close to the impellers, where at the discharge of the impeller, where we have much smaller bubbles. If you see the, the, the value, uh, the upper value, uh, which is the bubble size measurements anywhere. Uh, concerning population balance modeling for this, uh, this application, we, we tried to use CFD uh, coupled with TBM, but we have, we have too many issues on hydrodynamics because we are uh, focused on high gas fraction 
uh, more than five, ten percent of gas fraction, and uh, uh, hydrodynamics was not sufficiently well described by CFD, and we still work on the closure laws for that. That we decided to not couple, and we have wrong, also wrong results with uh, coupling PBN inside the CFD simulation. So finally, we just we have decided to use more simple approaches to make this uh, population balance uh, calculations. And we tested two approaches. The first one is the most simple one. We just work on it's a zero D approach, and we work on average values of dissipation rate and, and gas fraction. And we know that this is something very simple and very discussable. But we did it. It's very easy to screen kernels with this uh, simple approach. Uh, and, and we had also another approach, more uh, more physical, perhaps. It's a B zone approach. We divide the, the tanks in two zones. One is close to the impeller. It was swept volume by the impeller. And the other one is the bulk uh, volume. And uh, it is a more classical approach. You can see some papers of Palopeus or Malita uh, following the uh, same uh, separation in the zone approach. And by doing that, with a good kernel, we, can, we are able to predict well the bubble size in each, side, in each zone of the, of the flow. But uh, also, we found that using the zero D approach, the results were not so bad, and it was sufficient to estimate the average bubble size. Of course, we don't simulate the bubble size close to the impeller in this case, but it's sufficient in your case, in our case, to uh, to estimate the average bubble size, uh, which is uh, not a global rule. In fact, uh, we know that in other cases, this approach is wrong, and uh, there is a paper of uh, Antonio Buffo on, the, on this uh, on this on this topic. So for us, uh, zero D simulation was something acceptable, and we screen many kernels to, to see uh, what are the combinations we can use. And we found that the bracket kernel of Lacodem, collision frequency of Prince and Blanche, and Colalo's efficiency of Colalo Blue and Tavdarides works well in many many uh, conditions of gas of gas flow uh, rate and seven rate. Uh, also, something interesting is now is that now we use a Colalo Colo sense efficiency model. Which is more physical because it's more uh, theoretical, even if we have uh, fitting parameters. But it involves uh, fluid properties, uh, as you can see here. We have the surface tension, viscosity, density, and so on. So, probably something more flexible in terms of uh, modification of, of, uh, of uh, physical properties. So, the next question is how does this kernel behave if we change the physical properties, especially the surface tension? And we did it by comparing bubble size measurements in water, in water plus surfactants. We used boven serum, serum albumin, the ASA surfactant, a classical surfactant. We use also ethanol, and we use also a fermentation growth pool of proteins and enzymes. For these different systems, we have different surface tension, uh, which is decreased by the surfactants, uh, except for the ethanol, where the surface tension stand uh, at the level of the water. What we observe, we observe for, that, for example, for these operating conditions, we observe that we have all the time much smaller bubbles with surfactants than without. So the coalescence is modified a lot with these uh, additives. Some of them can be explained by the difference of surface tension, but it's not the case for water ethanol as for the bubble kernel. And concerning PBM, now if we use exactly the same uh, kernel validated in air water, air water system, if we don't change the fitting parameter, we apply it to these systems. And what we see that uh, the loss of surface tension uh, is not sufficiently uh, taken into account in the, in the kernel. The bubble size change a little bit. If we decrease the surface tension, we decrease the bubble size, but the sensitivity to surface tension is not sufficient. Uh, so, uh, as we are uh, chemical engineers, we can change the fitting parameters as we want. And uh, this is what we did. And uh, by changing the C prime function in the uh, coefficient in the, in the Colalo Blue and Tablarides model, uh, we have found that it, 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 it improved uh, a little bit the results. You know, we have, we have a better sensitivity to the, to the surface tension. Uh, so it could be something interesting to use if we have no other uh, possibilities. But it stands very, very empirical and uh, not fully satisfying because first we don't understand what we do and we miss the physics behind that, and also uh, does not explain, for example, does not explain uh, why uh, the uh, water plus ethanol uh, system 
as a less coalescent because the physics is, is missing also for this for this uh, fluid. So this is what we can do at this at this moment. We have empirical solutions to, to fit, but we it's not satisfying uh, yet. I would say. So I will finish just off with some some concluding remarks based on our small experience on population balance modeling. What we still believe is that PBM is a great help for scale up and design of reactors. It's also a good help to understand what's happening inside the, the system. Uh, for a given system, uh, we are confident with the use of uh, PBM. But uh, as, you, uh, as I reported, we uh, had some difficulties to use PBM for different systems. Uh, each time we try to do that, we have to refit some parameters to improve results. So uh, we think that coalescence is not well described. We think that some physics is missing uh, for that. And uh, of course, there is room for good research in this topic. And our uh, opinion is that it could be done with a more pluridisciplinary uh, approach involving physical chemistry and fluid mechanics. So that's all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, I would be happy to answer. Yeah, thank you very much for for this uh, very nice and inspiring talk, and I guess an excellent uh, talk for the beginning of of uh, our session because you showed uh, many many nice and, and interesting points. Ah, and there's already a question from uh, Ralf Krenat. He's asking, what is the most simple way to get started with measuring bubble size distributions for a gas liquid reaction? Use a CSTR with an endoscopic camera, measure uh, different gas holdups, and then build OD models based on the data. Or what do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, the problem is a, a high gas fraction. Uh, if you just work on a few, a few, uh, one percent of gas or less, uh, photographs can be used to, to have a bubble size distribution. But uh, when you investigate uh, the bubbly flows with 10% of gas or more, it's very, very difficult to have the bubble side distribution. I think with optical probe, it's difficult to, to do it because you measure distribution of cords, in fact, and passing from distribution of cords to, uh, to a bubble side distribution to diameters, it's, it's not so easy. Uh, so uh, probably on, with endoscopic method uh, and, and uh, machine learning and uh, perhaps uh, more uh, adapted uh, image processing, perhaps we could now get access to bubble side distribution. Uh, I think this is to be the future uh, if we really want to have the bubble side distribution. I don't believe personally that the multiple probes or clinical probes can be used for estimate, have a good estimation of the bubble size distribution. For the SOTA diameter, perhaps it can work, but not for the distribution. Mm. Uh, after uh, now, I have no 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 real uh, answer to this question, but uh, it's still a very difficult topic to have good double side distribution in dense flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can discuss this uh, later on in the last presentation when we talk about measurement uh, techniques for, for getting bubble size distributions. And uh, there's a second question from Karol Ulantowski. He's asking, um, thank you for the extremely interesting presentation. If I saw correctly, all presented experimental results were for the bubbles with diameters with millimeter range. In my studies, I tackle the problems of nano bubbles, uh, i.g. bubbles which diameters are below one micrometer. Could you comment on whether do you think it is possible to apply present methods also to nano bubble study, uh, studies? Uh, <laughs> I, I think the, the physics of uh, breakage and coalescence uh, is not the same at this scale. Uh, we, here we are dominated by the turbulence uh, scales. We are in the inertial regime, in the inertial regime of the turbulent cascade, and uh, we have uh, we have some uh, phenomena of breakage. So the turbulence is dominant on, on, on that. Uh, probably if you talk about nanobubbles, uh, coalescence or uh, breakage is uh, due to other physics. Uh, so uh, I'm not specialized on, on, this, on this topic. I, I think we can. I have colleagues working on PBM with uh, very small droplets. Mm -hmm. So I think PBM can be used in many, many different uh, uh, applications and uh, whatever the, the bubble size or the inclusion size you, you have, but the physics behind that, the, the, the breakage, breakage and coalescence uh, uh, frequency will not be uh, written at all uh, with the same physics and will not involve turbulence, I think. But 
Mm-hmm. So okay. for sure you can do it, I think, but uh, you cannot use the same models that the one I presented here. Okay, perfect. Yeah, there are two more questions. Maybe um, um, Frederick, you can answer them um, in the in the chat, and we can discuss this, of course, also uh, at the end again. Yes. Okay. But uh, to keep in time, so thank you very much uh, once again for your very very thank nice you. uh, presentation and uh, also the, the nice discussion. And I would like to, to continue with our next uh, presentation that comes from industry now. So let's see where are the uh, demands directly from uh, chemical industry from the BSF company, and we have here uh, Julia Hofinger and uh, Sebastian Meinicke, and uh, both uh, will us uh, tell something about uh, PBM for bubbly flows in industry, small scale experiments and large scale experiments. Please, uh, Julia, go ahead. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, thank you also for the kind introduction uh, of Sebastian and myself. So I'm in the reaction engineering group at BSF and Sebastian is in the fluid dynamics group doing CFD. Uh, I will share my screen and hope that you see it. Yes. Um, so we we had quite a few discussions um, internally. When I say internally, we have uh, experts on multiphase reactors, for instance, Oliver Bay uh, and fluid dynamics uh, experts as well uh, on uh, bubbly flows, how to scale them up, how much modeling we can do. Essentially, the, uh, the topics that Frederick has already uh, started discussing, that's also what is um, touching our everyday lives. And um, so we try to reach out to, to people outside of the company. And this is a continuation of this. We want to show our constraints, our uh, view of the world, but certainly that's uh, very limited. So it would be um, our intention to get a discussion going and feel free to also get in contact with us afterwards. You can reach us via email, via LinkedIn. Um, we really would be interested in different views and also in synergies. This is, in our opinion, uh, a problem that is um, of wider interest. Um, so what are we going to discuss in the next few minutes? It's uh, population balance is for bubbly flows in industry. So it's really about the application to uh, large apparatus in the end. We are not going to discuss, for instance, precipitation, where we have had quite a few successes, uh, emulsions, offloatations. I saw uh, a previous collaborator in the audience uh, who worked with us on uh, flotation. So it's really nice to see those cycles close. Um, what are we doing? Uh, we we want to discuss um, all the apparatus that Frederick mentioned, bubble columns, stirred tanks, chat loop reactors, um, and how we have small scale experiments available, modeling available, and want to go into uh, very large apparatus. Very large apparatus. I will have to annoy you now with a few numbers about the company, not uh, because of the numbers, but to give you a, a background on what is really our world, a zoo of um, different processes that we are looking into, which makes it very exciting, but also complex. So we uh, deliver chemistry products into almost all industries. So just um, when I started today, the toothbrush, the detergent that washed my shirt, uh, the vitamins in uh, some of our, new, uh, in our food, um, ibuprofen, if you had a headache, there are many, many um, products that uh, regardless of how much we want to minimize our impact that are making our life better. And we want to have those produced. And the idea is really the, the ambition of the company is to do that uh, in a very responsible way. So we're combining economic success, um, getting Optima, but also doing this socially and uh, environmentally uh, responsibly. And that's going to lead us through the entire presentation. Um, there's, of course, um, a significant amount of money involved, but more importantly, a lot of uh, colleagues, expertise, experience uh, that we can tap into for very different processes. And this is also spread over the entire world. So it's not like we are focusing on one product, one car that we are optimizing. It's um, many different chemistries. And that also gives us um, that wide range of interests to discuss. Um, 
regarding the responsibility that I mentioned, that is really driving innovation at the moment, of course. So we are discussing about energy topics, uh, heat as well, um, different new te technologies. So if you look into uh, new reactor designs, into electrification, closing material uh, loops, so having e-ducts going back into the cycle, or also using bio-based feedstocks. That, of course, uh, gives us very different rheologies, as Frederick has already mentioned for some processes, but also other demands uh, that we need to consider. Um, and we need to get better at everything. So continuous improvement of every process that we are looking into to squeeze out that last drop to make better use of the energy that we are putting in. That is the overarching topic that I think leads uh, very nicely to what we are looking into today. We need to get a better understanding of our processes, including multi-phase flows, because we have varying feedstocks. We have uh, to get uh, an understanding of what we are actually doing with the resources that we have available. Uh, so we have that motivation sorted out. How do we do it? Of course, it's, it sounds trivial. We have um, a chemistry and a catalyst um, in many cases um, that are doing uh, the job that they are supposed to do and we need to do our process development. Uh, how does process development classically look? It's a linear process from our idea uh, via lab, classic small scale semi-batch batch processes um, to going into a mini plant, very small the flow rate, still small amounts of material generated. I cannot test in huge uh, cubic meter scales uh, to get a bubble size and the scale up effect verified for a specific system. Uh, often the, the apparatus system might still not be fully defined. Um, for some processes, we do pilot plants. So those are already a massive investment if you, for instance, have a new technology uh, that you have not run on a, a large scale before uh, to ensure that you minimize your uncertainties. And then you go into the produ production plant. The trend, however, is to minimize those intermediate steps, especially the pilot plant, but also in some cases the mini plant, simply to get faster and to also um, reduce uh, the effort that we are taking in, in between because we trust our understanding and that we are again at the modeling aspect, yes. If we can model something, predict something, we can get faster and better. And that is also the more um, current view uh, of our state-of-the-art process development. So it's much more interactive. Um, all of those steps um, cycle into each other. It's not a one-way street. So um, we might come up with an idea based on plant production data. Yeah. So we might go back into the lab, might do some modeling. It goes in, in all directions. And in some cases, it's, it's uh, small modifications that we want to verify. So really, those shortcuts are very beneficial and highly welcome and lead to iterations for constant improvement. And, and that is really also um, a trend that we are seeing more and more that interaction between the different divisions. So as Frederick said, that uh, multidisciplinary approach that really gives benefits, but of course also makes life more interesting. So um, I think that is um, where we might also go with the population balances. Um, the simulations uh, in the process innovation are everywhere. Um, from a smart design of our experiments, having a better understanding of those experimental setups, minimizing expensive experiments. We might do different ones, cheaper ones, smaller ones, uh, in order to get better at the scale up to understand the process better. Uh, of course, skipping those steps that I mentioned that are expensive and slow is very attractive. And in the end, also condensing that knowledge. Yes, if you have understood something, uh, derive correlations, models, having databases also to um, have the data available later on. All of those factors go hand in hand and are a wonderful field for playing. But uh, reality is biting us now. Um, of course, we have um, to improve uh, our processes. Our scientists and engineers um, are striving to optimize our processes, yes looking into new chemistries, new catalysts, uh, different operation modes, different energy integration options, process in intensification in every way imaginable, yes. But at the same time, our reactors are unique items. They are not built as cars in series. So um, we have to learn for each of those processes 
and need to consider the business perspective, which is get it working soon. <laughs> uh, we cannot afford to play on the large scale for a long time. So that startup, you know, startup issues need to, mini need to be minimized. Um, so when we propose an improvement, it must work. Um, and at the same time, it needs to be done fast. So the time to market is very important. So it should make it to that improvement somehow and at the same time work well. Uh, that balance um, is what makes life interesting and fun. And it's different for our different segments. As I mentioned, we go into different uh, categories of sizes of processes. Um, you can separate them in commodities, so large continuous plants, which really squeeze out that last drop, go to minimal cost, simply because if you have that large process, even a small fraction, a small percentage point can still be very large numbers. Um, their intensive R&D, of course, pays off even for the small improvements. Um, on the other hand, you have specialties which have very frequent product changes, innovations that need to go into uh, the existing equipment rather quickly. Um, maybe you have traces that change and affect your process. Uh, here you cannot do the very small changes um, for our ambitious process optimization. Here it's more about having a robust um, setup that works with different educts, for instance. Um, so in any of those cases, as I mentioned, we have those business constraints which determine that we have to have a robust apparatus, have to have broad optima, some flexibility depending on what is coming from reality. But at the same time, we want to, of course, push it to get uh, that optimum really utilized and found. Uh, what makes multi-phase flows different? So let's go a bit further. Um, it's that additional uh, complexity um, especially for gas-liquid flows of the hydrodynamics, the fluid dynamics, uh, and the mass transfer. So if we look at the chemistry, of course, we want to have intrinsic kinetics and the transport phenomena understood. And for scale-up, especially that um, mass transfer, the fluid dynamics, that changes. And that understanding is critical. So we want to have um, sensitivity analysis, as Frederick suggested, uh, sometimes in simplified models, it doesn't have to be the full-fledged CFD. Um, it's really about getting an understanding of where our handles, where, where do we need to understand the system. Um, and safety is always a, a constraint that we have to uh, include as well. So that control of our concentration profiles, for instance, and that goes directly into reactor design. We want to have a full uh, mathematical model. That's our ambition. Uh, and we often do fluid dynamic experiments. Sometimes they are virtual in a CFD. Sometimes they are in a physical equipment. Um, it's really about how detailed that investigation is necessary. Um, in all cases, as I mentioned, we are going more and more into those uh, multidisciplinary approaches. And with that, we really want to look at that multi-phase aspect. Why do we want to understand this? Um, just as an example for the mass transfer mentioned, uh, the bubble size distribution is sometimes interesting as I will show for the equipment design, uh, but also for associated phenomena like mass transfer. Um, we see that even traces of um, species in our educts or in our um, system can, can have a dramatic effect on coalescence. Um, the, the example, of course, is now uh, one that you will find in many different variations in our presentations. The, the bottom line is we don't have a full understanding. And as Frederick also mentioned, we also agree uh, surface tension is not enough to predict this. So we want to have a, an idea on this. And of course, also geometry affects our, um, affect how we then uh, go into reality. So that's just an example to show how uh, that apparatus design and the scale-up can be improved with that better understanding of multiphase physics. So if I have um, initial bubble sizes that are already uh, giving us, uh, it might not necessarily be bad, but different uh, bubble size distributions, we should know about it. And that really would improve our, the quality of our work. So the, the ambition, is a scale up and that is really what we need uh, of a safe, robust and efficient reactor. Um, and for that, we need to control concentration and temperature profiles. Um, 
what does um, our example show here? That's a jet loop reactor with um, a liquid entraining gas that is free surface entraining liquid as well. Going through a draft tube, we have some more gas um, added in the in the ring area here. The bubble dynamics, the mass transfer, uh, that will be further discussed by Sebastian on the CFD. Um, what what um, determines our design are certain constraints and degrees of freedom. So we need to determine at some point the concept, uh, the dimensions. How do I choose that? Of course, if I expect very fine bubbles and need to achieve gas separation down here. So sometimes it's the periphery that determines what we are going for. Um, we need to know how much gas we would expect down there to determine how we get a gas separation, for instance, if we want to do that in that apparatus. On the other hand, we want to optimize our internals, get an optimum mass transfer. So uh, that balance of knowing where how much gas is and what it is contributing to our reaction um, really helps us with uh, optimizing and controlling those concentration and temperature profiles. So it naturally goes towards a model-based scale-up. Um, and that involves some small scale experiments that we can do uh, on the chemistry side, so intrinsic kinetics, physical, physical property data, and that is really the link towards the uh, population balances, the, the coalescence. We, we can do small experiments just looking into whether there is a coalescence tendency, yes or no. Uh, we would rather have a quantification for real systems to really get an efficient workflow for those um, kernels regardless of whether they are now in that formulation that we know or whether something else comes up so that really the experiment is defined. Um, and with that, we go into the characterization of our apparatus of the system. So it's always the combination of apparatus and fluids, gas and liquid. Um, there we do classic evaluations, circulation rates, mixing times, um, gas holdup estimates <laughs> or measurements. Um, bubble sizes really, we do not do detailed work there. Um, and uh, also mass and heat transfer effects need to be considered. So those are uh, the things that we look into. And of course, what does it boil down to? Uh, population balances for those multi-phase flows and CFD are a natural combination that will give us benefits. So the population balances for the gas dynamics, uh, for the gas holdups, for the bubble size distributions and resulting mass transfer effects and the combination with CFD just to get um, the overall picture for the design, yes, for the apparatus and for the scale up. Uh, it's simply a, a very useful combination that we all agree on, but for real systems, we do see some um, limitations on where we can actually realize this. And with this, I hand over to uh, Sebastian to talk about the CFD and then we continue with how we see the real systems and experiments. Yeah, warm, w welcome also from my side. I just have to give a warning because my internet is kind of unstable. So just in case I drop out, Julia, you might just take over. Um, but I hope everything will be fine. Okay, so um, let's go into the CFD part. Julia, knowledge-based scale up, and that's also the point where um, CFD, which we do inside um, BSF, can help our colleagues to support that. Scale up is done along different criteria among which are often the mixing behavior or the mass and heat transfer performance. Um, these criteria are then translated into key performance indicators like for example, the ma macro mixing time, KLA values, but also um, things like the mean gas holdup in the reactor um, loop flow ratios, separation efficiencies at the bottom. And um, we can quantify these KPIs um, from CFD via the insights into flow, phase, or concentration fields we get. So um, that's one way to um, support the scale up. Another is um, just to focus with CFD on specific aspects. Um, meaning the optimization of specific parts of the reactor internals like um, deflection, baffles, um, yeah, the optimization and actual design of such components is often done via CFD. Um, 
this is the one part where CFD can help, but another part is also to um, use CFD as a um, as a yeah, deep dive into some um, aspects of the reactor, some physical aspects which are um, badly known. And um, an example for this would, for example, be the injection of bubbles into the reactor, which can happen both at um, gas barges or through entrainment um, into the liquid jet. And we can support this um, via um, detailed CFD simulations. Then we can do distinctions of um, flow regimes, um, help to, um, yeah, to explain the phenomena along this. And of course, an important point is what you can um, do with CFD is um, to simply test different material properties and to have an um, approximation of the real reactor behavior just by including um, material properties which might not be um, yeah, be investigated so thoroughly from the experimental side. So, and I think Julia explained a lot uh, um, for this um, schematic drawing of the reactor already. I won't go into too much de details, but maybe as a message, um, there are many different processes um, happening at different lengths or time scales um, relying on different physical aspects. And the conclusion for us CFD engineers is that there is no one model fits it all approach, but that depending on, on what we define to be the focus of our um, work, of our investigation, we have to be flexible in also choosing the um, appropriate CFD approach. There exist um, different methods, um, as you probably all know. Um, if we want to go further into um, aspects concerning the whole um, reactor geometry, um, and we might not be, be too much interested into very fine details, then um, the two fluid methods are a um, good approach as um, they are often feasible for entire reactor geometries, also in real dimensions, but they rely on several um, assumptions. I will go into this in a second. And if we just want to focus on the entrainment, for example, we want to um, see the effects of surface tension, etc. really have a deep dive into this phenomenon. We uh, might afford an, an interface resolving method like um, volume of fluid, which relies on fewer assumptions, but carries along a very high computational effort. So um, as I said, there's no one model fits it all, but in the following, I will still con focus on the two fluid methods for bubbly flows in particular. So um, if it comes to handle such problems, um, we often have uh, um, constraints concerning resources, concerning time. So there are some um, problems in the design of new processes or in plant operation, which need to be solved very quickly. Um, and this has led over the years to a um, standard workflow, um, which is based on many experience gathered in our CFD group. And um, this standard workflow is just to have a first um, shot onto the problem with a um, simple approach saying um, you have a constant bubble size or a few constant bubble size bins um, whose um, size you determine from, from literature or from sparta geometry con considerations. Then you add simple turbulence models. I mean, um, K epsilon runs models, etc. So um, very um, broad, broadly applied models. You um, rely on proven um, bubble force correlations and models, and you um, might add a simple mass transfer modeling method. And this um, has, um, in our experience, yielded very often results in sufficient quality and accuracy um, for the cases um, we need it for or for the questions our plans um, ask. Um, but nevertheless, um, maybe you just 
Yeah. And there are, of course, also cases where this um, simple approach, I mean, the simple approach we often complement it by sensitivity analyze, analysis or by mesh studies. So um, we prove our results, of course, but there are some specific cases where um, we really um, interested in simulations with varying bubble diameters. Um, and these cases occur especially at um, high gas holdups and the associated um, flow regimes and for readily coalescing um, systems. I mean, um, Frederick also mentioned um, the, the, the meaning of coalescence and difficulties in modeling it. And um, or um, if you have a reactor with um, some mixing devices, which leads to a clear distinction of different bubble sizes inside the reactor, which you need to take into consideration or um, chemical reaction systems, which rely heavily on local mass transfer conditions. And if they rely on local mass transfer conditions, they also rely on the local bubble size distribution. These are cases where we're really interested in um, yeah, in enhanced methods. And um, we also um, um, think that um, population balance methods are a very promising way to tackle such problems. And we have also gath gathered experience in the past with that. I mean, it's um, mostly before my time at BSF, so time of Julia, but also of her Pre predecessor, so um, going back to Peter Renze, who initialized, I think it was, uh, who carried out, um, I think it was back in 2014, this um, project together with um, the group around um, Professor Marquisio, and um, there were applications of the QMO method um, to industry, industry scale problems. Then um, in recent years, we also gathered um, further experience with the multiple size group method um, and applied it also to an industry scale reactor. I cannot show details at this point for confidentiality reasons. So that's, that, that's only a demonstrator um, image of our um, software supplier. Um, but nevertheless, um, what we want to get at so far is that we lack um, still trust into the PVM methods and we lack also an efficient workflow that we can easily apply this also if a problem occurs um, spontaneously and needs to be resolved in due time. So what do we su suggest just from our point of view, from our restricted point of industry, view, um, we would um, suggest to have three um, main um, working packages, which should be addressed in our point of view. The first one is um, on the small scale. Um, we need an improved understanding of the physics that happen, and um, that happen especially at um, difficult cases, meaning high gas holdups or for organic liquids and fluids with complex rheology. We need um, physically um, sound models that include all the um, dependencies best possible. And then um, it's also important to um, translate this into an efficient workflow. Efficient workflow means that we can easily apply this, um, that we have kernels with few parameters, with parameters that can, where we have a um, yeah, description on how to determine them. And then in the third step, just also, um, as I mentioned, the trust, we need to increase the trust that we really go the step into applying these methods for large scale applications. We need validations of the models and meaning we not only need validations at the small scale, but also on the large scale. So that we have a proof that scale up works um, with the models developed, meaning um, results corresp correspond well at different geometry sizes, that it works also for different uh, apparatuses, um, including the um, standard um, reactor types like stir tanks, uh, bubble columns, and jet loop reactors. And of course, that it works for the fluids, which are of high interest for our processes. So um, to sum this up, 
some aspects which should be um, taken into consideration. We should have physically well-founded models because that increases the probability that they are well extensible to many use cases. And um, we think that it also makes sense to have a modular setup so we, that we can distinguish different effects like bubble dynamics, what's, um, what's rather due to um, turbulence effects, etc. And then um, we need an easy handling, meaning as few parameters as possible. And with this, I hand back to you, Julia. Um, I, I cannot see Michael, but I'm sure he is already uh, uh, looking at the watch. So I try to be fast uh, with the last few slides. It's just um, continuing with that parameter calibration and a few parameters. Why do we say few parameters? The hope is to have an easier, easier approach for calibration and also some guidelines. What is a minimum volume for our experiment that we need? So if we look at, uh, for instance, that viscous broth that has a very wide uh, bubble size distribution, very fine bubbles which uh, yield a huge gas holdup and occasionally that huge bubble that is, that is erupting uh, almost at the size of the entire tank. Of course, this is for illustration purposes, but just to give an idea, do we need to have to have a uh, large bubble uh, physically in our system uh, to predict such a system? I don't know. Um, and the same thing for, for um, more standard fluids that are of high interest to us. Uh, what is the suitable setup? What dissipation rates do I need? Do I need to be turbulent? Is a film drainage experiment uh, complementary um, already on a small scale to give us an indication for those um, calibration options? And at the same time, uh, what is um, relevant for us is, of course, those real systems. For water and air, it's all good. But if we have pressure, temperature, different um, fluids that are messy, opaque, what experiments are suitable. And if the method is available, fantastic. Maybe we need to go the other way around and think, what do we need to observe? And then think about what method is there that uh, would help us. And to get that um, confidence that those real systems have been calibrated properly. And as Sebastian said, that those corners can then be applied to a wide range uh, also of dissipation rates, for instance. So that is really where we see uh, potential and uh, also different ways of approaching this. So to summarize this, and <laughs> this is really a, a, our limited world view. So we see trends driving change and innovations, mostly uh, it's sustainability driving this and we need to be fast for obvious reasons. Um, what really makes um, the work and life here very fun is the complexity, the different processes and the teamwork. It's very diverse. And that is also how we see interaction with the outside world. Um, that application to plan scale, we I hope have illustrated that balance between being fast, having small experiments that are flexible for different processes um, to allow us to have those improvements um, while at the same time mitigating risks. So it should work when we propose something. Um, and we are really striving for this broad, optimal and robust designs, especially because of safety, but also because we need reliable plans. So those constraints um, limit um, what we can do with existing methods that have been proven also for different scales for water and air, that uh, real uh, phenomena changes in traces of what we are getting um, that affect coalescence behavior, but are not seen on the surface tension yet, for instance, different gases, etc. cetera. That, that understanding would be very helpful. So in order to get a better prediction of real systems, um, we hope uh, for the continuation of work in this field. So we see positive trends with more and more detailed um, models, also more physics-based models. Uh, Michael has done some interesting studies with a large eddy simulations in stir tanks. We don't see that yet for those complex population balances or multi-phase flows at higher gas contents, but it's probably going in that direction. And that's positive to see the trend for population balances, as we said, that feasible, uh, fast parameter calibration, the reliability and the understanding of um, how we can do a scale up different systems, a stir tank versus a, a chat loop or a bubble column for real uh, fluids. 
that would be a, a very large benefit for application of CFD and population balance models. Otherwise, we stare at the model, uh, say it's very fascinating, but it's not helping us in the end. Um, and at the same time, I think um, that also better access to available data would help in collaboration then. So standardized experiments, standardized um, documentation in databases, for instance, might give us that boost for that co collaboration. Um, and of course, we also see potential in also further experimental methods that could be standardized, for instance, um, KLA measurements in organic liquids with hydrogen, etc. All of those things are highly welcome and where we certainly don't have the answers and would be very happy to discuss. I guess we have overdrawn our time um, a bit, but thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so welcome back to the second part of our webinar today. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to um, introduce the next uh, presentation that will be given by Antonio Buffi Buffo. Antonio Buffo is uh, from the group of uh, Daniele Macisio at the Politecnico di Torino. So we have the next presentation from Italy. And uh, now we will see something about uh, population balance modeling and uh, in last eddy simulations. Julia has just uh, mentioned the collaboration with uh, the group of Daniele Macisio and Antonio Beaufort, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation now. Please, the screen is yours, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I'm going to present uh, instead of Daniele today, because he was not uh, available today. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, the results that we obtained in the recent years. So in the last six, seven years, uh, let me start the, the presentation with a, a bit of uh, introduction on the, uh, on, the, on the work that we have done on this topic on population balances and bubble flows. So we started in more or less in the 2002 with the work of Francesco Bertola. Uh, who started his PhD in modeling of bubble uh, columns uh, with CFD uh, uh, under the supervision of Professor Marco Vanni, who worked on this on, on this topic also. And uh, then uh, a year later, Daniele uh, joined the, the research group. And then we started looking at population balances and coupling population balances with CFD. So uh, the work of Miriam Petitti in 2005 uh, we uh, simulated directed steroid tank with CFD and population balances in collaboration with the, Itali the Italian oil company, ENI. And then uh, on the few years later in 2010, I started to work, uh, I started to work on uh, multivariate population balance modeling for turbulent gas liquid flows. In and part of this work was done in cooperation with BSF. So uh, the last year of uh, my PhD and a few years of postdoc. And then uh, the, all the work that was done in these uh, 10 years, uh, uh, more or less 10 years was condensed into the, into the publication of the book of Daniele Marchisio and Professor Rodney Fox uh, published uh, by uh, Cambridge Press. Uh, so uh, what we consider uh, as a solved issue, so what, what, which was the results of these 10 years of work? So basically uh, what we know is that to describe bubble polys polydispersity, uh, a solution of the population balance uh, is needed to be coupled with CFD. And so uh, the quadrature based moment methods are very cheap and efficient, and it's a, a good way to, to, to do that. Then uh, in order to describe uh, mass transfer chemical reactions, we need to know uh, what is the bubble size distribution. And uh, um, so the CFD PBM uh, framework uh, uh, can be used to do so. And uh, we can obtain a reliable prediction for air and pure water systems. Uh, we know uh, the, the kernels that we can use. We can predict uh, bubble size distribution. We can predict uh, uh, gas sold up. We can predict uh, other global properties like the power consumption. And we can describe also different flow regimes, uh, both for steered tanks and aerated bubble column. And uh, we can do uh, this uh, using both commercial codes like ANSYS Fluent or open source codes. So uh, like OpenFOAM, for instance. 
Then instead, uh, um, basically, the presentation of today is going to be on the recent work. So the work that we started from 2015 up to now uh, with the work of these uh, three people, Luca Gemello, who started working uh, in the 2015 on the modeling of uh, uh, bubble columns uh, in cooperation with the EFPEN and Regine Nouvel, and, uh, and was also cited by the previous presentation by Frederic Roger. And then uh, the work of Mossen, uh, who started his PhD in the, for the simulation of uh, vertical pipe flows in 2017. And then the last person who worked in, on, on this topic was Francesco Maniscalco, who started in 2019 for modeling of two, uh, for modeling of two phase and three phase flows. Um, so what was not solved yet? So what, what, what was the, uh, the, the, the issues that we were tackling for, uh, in the, in, for the work of these three people? So first of all, we wanted to improve the simulation stability in general, because sometimes we found out that the simulation were not so stable. And so we decided to go uh, and to improve that aspect. Then we wanted to have a, a, a more accurate numerical methods for solving the moments transport equation that are solved using the quadrature based moment method. And then we wanted to have a better description of multi phase turbulence and have uh, and improve the uh, kernels uh, to be used for also for high superficial velocity regimes. So the presentation of today uh, is going to be uh, is going to be the this one. So we are going to uh, I'm going to uh, show you the results that we obtained using the RANS modeling. Uh, so two phase RANS modeling, and I'm going to present what is called the phase blending description. Then uh, I I will go I want to give you uh, a few um, uh, a few uh, hints on uh, high order. Uh, spatial discretization schemes for moment equations. And then the last uh, topic that I will touch is the coupling of LES and population balance modeling. So the last part of the work was what that was done by, by Francesco. And then I'm, in, I'm going to conclude with the final remarks. So let me start first with the RANS modeling. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the framework that we are using and we are talking about also Frederick, uh, 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 give this uh, this um, uh, introduction in this presentation, so I'll be quick. Uh, we are starting from uh, two phase uh, flow um, description using volume fraction. So this is the so called Eulerian Eulerian approach. Uh, basically, we are not describing the dub the bubbles. We are considering instead volume fractions and uh, and momentum associated with uh, each phase. Uh, the trick is that uh, we need to describe the interaction between the phases using uh, different uh, contributions that I reported here. So um, we have to consider the drag, the lift, the wall lubrication, virtual mass, and turbulent dispersion. All these contributions uh, uh, basically uh, uh, will have an influence on how we define the interfacial first force uh, term in the momentum balance equation. And we couple this approach with the population balance modeling, which we are solving for uh, the, the bubble size distribution, in this case for gas liquid system. And we are writing a, a transport equation for the, for the uh, bubble size distribution. And instead of solving this equation, we are solving equations for some moments uh, of the uh, size distribution that is uh, defined here. And then we are writing so a few moment transport equation. And uh, we, are, we are writing the source term of these moments based on the quadrature assumption. Um, so uh, let, me, let me move on with the, uh, with the top, next topic. So the phase blending, and let me give an introduction. So basically, yeah, let me start also with the, okay, I cannot do that by using this, okay. All right. So um, basically in the two fluid plus VBM framework, uh, we have a dispersed bubble in the liquid here in the bottom part of the column, 
But then in the simulation, it is included also a top part because we want to simulate how much the liquid level rise into the, into, in the system. And, uh, but we are not interested in, in actually fully resolve uh, the interface here, which is in the mar here in the market region, market red region, uh, between the top hair and, uh, and the dispersion below. Uh, so um, what we want to do is to find an approach that uh, makes simulation stable and fast and do not uh, and do not need us to really resolve this interface. I'm saying this because we noticed that in the past a lot of instability of the simulation was due to the what was happening in this region. Um, so basically one approach that we uh, tried was to use this so-called blending. So what we have done is to consider uh, the total interfacial force term as a summation of two different contributions. One is the so-called the force calculated from for uh, dispersed bubbles in water. So basically is what is going on here below the liquid level. And then a second contribution in which we account for dispersed uh, droplets of water in air. So what is going on instead on the, on the top of, uh, um, of the column. What we did this in, uh, in open form, uh, in which actually this linear uh, blending approach uh, was already implemented. I reported here in these slides uh, uh, the, 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 the actual uh, implementation of uh, this aspect done in open form. Uh, what I was to stress here today is uh, just this, uh, uh, the picture here that I reported. So basically, at low uh, local gas volume fraction, we have bubbles that are totally dispersed, fully dispersed in water. Then we have uh, a region in which uh, uh, the bubbles are partially dispersed in water, which is the yellow region. And then we have a region in green here that I, I, did, I uh, highlighted in green, uh, which we have droplets in air. And uh, the definition of this transition between bubbles dispersed in water and droplets in air uh, can be defined by the user by the definition of these parameters. So the definition of uh, these volume fractions, PD stands for partial dispersed, uh, FD stands for uh, fully dispersed. So basically we played a bit, uh, Francesco played a bit during Francesco Maniscalco played a bit with the, these parameters during his PhD, trying to find wh which is the best, uh, uh, which are the best parameters for uh, for uh, the simulation of gas liquid systems, and uh, for doing so we considered a test case, uh, and uh, it was a standard bubble column of forty centimeter. Uh, diam for diameter. And this was experimentally investigated by Luca Gemello, a previous PhD uh, from our group. And uh, in this case, uh, it was considered a, a, pure air, uh, a pure air water system, a different superficial velocity ranging from uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous regimes. Then first, uh, we look at the extension of the region of uh, uh, bubbles uh, uh, dispersed uh, in, uh, in, uh, in water. And we uh, perform the different simulations by uh, changing only that parameter. And we found out that more or less uh, the results are the same. Uh, actually, for some values, the results are, are, are better. Uh, so it seems that uh, for this case, uh, the lower the value uh, is, the better the results are. And, uh, but the, the largest uh, effect is on the volume fraction and not on the uh, velocity of the liquid, for instance. And then uh, we made, we performed also simulation by looking at the extension of the region in which uh, uh, the 
the, the droplets uh, are uh, dispersed in, in air. And uh, also in this case, we found out that we have more or less similar results for these two values, but very different from other values that we tried. So uh, we then select, uh, by looking at these results, uh, uh, two, these two parameters that then we use for all the simulations that we carry out and that I'm going to show you uh, in this presentation. Uh, it is important to mention that there is a, a, a connection between uh, uh, this blending factor and uh, the swarm correction that usually is used for describing uh, the, uh, the increase of the uh, drug force in uh, um, heterogeneous regimes. So uh, what we found out in the work that we carried out with Luca Gemello in the past was that if we use this uh, uh, swarm correction, swarm factor correction, uh, used, uh, um, proposed by uh, the work of Simone, uh, this is an experimental correlation that describes the fact that the bubbles uh, uh, experience, the, store, the, the swarm of bubbles experience an increase of, of drug force uh, uh, up to a certain um, up to a certain value of the uh, uh, local volume fraction, and then there is a sharp decrease um, of this uh, of this uh, of this factor of this correction factor for the for the drug coefficient. Uh, this decrease goes to zero, but then when we uh, perform the CFD practical CFD simulations, what we end up ended up was that. Uh, very large bubbles uh, uh, were created and it, that are very that are not physical uh, that are not appearing actually physically in this system. So uh, what what Luca Gemello proposed was that instead of going to zero for this swarm correction, let's put like uh, a, a threshold and then we fix the value uh, for this threshold. Uh, in, in such a way to obtain the right uh, uh, global gas volume fraction. This approach was, uh, I would say, um, very arbitrary. In fact, the value of this uh, correction was uh, uh, different from, for different uh, superficial velocity. Um, instead, by using the blending approach, uh, uh, we don't need to fix uh, this, uh, uh, this value for the Simonet correction, but we, we can use the Simonet correction straight away. And we carried out the simulation in order to compare the results given by the different methods. So the one uh, from Luca and uh, uh, the one that instead found out uh, Francesco using the blending, the blending approach. And the results that we obtained were very similar. So basically, uh, by considering uh, this uh, blending approach, we can get rid of that source of uh, arbitrariness that uh, was introduced by the work of Luca Gemello. And what about the computational time? Well, basically, when we uh, <laughs> compared the computational time, we were uh, surprised that uh, the blending approach basically out the, uh, the computational time. And this is due to the fact that uh, uh, most of the computational time was spent to uh, calculate interactions uh, of uh, the different phases in regions in which uh, uh, we are not interested in. So the blending basically, blending approach basically uh, cut down that problem and increased a lot the efficiency of the simulation. Let me move now to uh, the second topic. So the high order spatial discretization scheme for moment transport equation. And uh, I, I could probably spend uh, half an hour discussing about uh, this part, but I'm trying to, to be quick. And uh, uh, what I want to say here is that uh, we uh, started this work because we were investigating a different gas liquid system a test case that uh, is reported here. So in this case, the air was injected laterally in order to mimic the uh, formation of bubbles uh, on the wall due to boiling. Instead, in this case, are really injected uh, 
in order to simulate just the fluid dynamics of the system. And then we have a flow of water that is rising uh, upward in this vertical pipe. Uh, we try to simulate this system with our, uh, our methods, so CFD and PBM. And what, was, what, we, what we obtained in this case were very surprising at the beginning. So uh, we use always first order upwind scheme for the moment transport equation. And what we found out was that there was a very, uh, for this system and only for this system, this, there was this a huge difference between air volume fraction calculated by uh, the volume fraction transport equation and the air volume fraction instead calculated from the moments of the distribution. There was this very huge mismatch due to the fact that in this system we have very high numerical diffusion in the transverse uh, direction of the flow. So how to solve this problem? Well, basically, in order to remove numerical diffusion, we need to use high order uh, numerical schemes. This is what, uh, I, what this is taught by uh, in CFD uh, courses. Well, basically, for the moment, uh, it is not possible to, to use standard second order uh, schemes uh, because of the non-realizability problem. So when, when we use high order schemes, uh, we notice that we have uh, oscillations in the values and these oscilla oscillations produced negative values for the moments. And here, for instance, I reported uh, the region of negative values that we were, that we were obtaining in that simulation, and the, which is very large, by the way. And uh, um, so we had this non-realizability problem. And with the non-realizability problem, so negative, uh, uh, negative moments formed in the domain, we are not able to uh, calculate the quadrature weights and quadrature nodes from the moments. So um, this is, was a, a, a very, uh, this was a, a very uh, known issue uh, from uh, the method of moments community. What we proposed to do, uh, what Mossen proposed to do was to, uh, instead of using uh, different uh, uh, limiters from uh, the total variation diminishing schemes, uh, we used instead the same value of the limiter uh, for all the moments equation that we uh, were transporting. This is uh, uh, the same thing that it is done, for instance, when you are transporting uh, fractions, uh, concentration fractions, mass fractions uh, for um, different species when you are solving problem in which you want to transport multiple species in your domain. So the same was done for a moments transport equation. And we tested this, uh, this uh, solution with, that we called equal limiter scheme uh, for 1D uh, very simple problem, uh, 1D Riemann problem. Then we tested on a, 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 a more complicated system, a 2D lead driven cavity flow problem. And the results were very promising. We were really able to obtain a, um, a, sharper, uh, a sharper solution without uh, uh, having realizability issues. And then we tested this on uh, our uh, original problem, a fully 3D CFD PBM simulation. And what we found out was that we were able to uh, have uh, uh, a similar description for the air volume fraction, both if, we, if it is calculated from uh, the two fluid part of the model and both if we are calculating that from uh, the moment. So by using this equal limiter scheme, we were able to solve this issue of uh, uh, lower schemes uh, used for uh, the calculation of the moment transport equation. Then let me move to uh, another uh, topic uh, of this talk. So the LES modeling. Um, RANS are the uh, most commonly used uh, um, for simulation for uh, gas liquid PBM um, uh, simulations. And uh, the uh, averaging procedure of course, what we know is that we uh, 
avoidably uh, uh, lose some local information. Instead, large eddy simulations uh, are able to solve a larger scale for uh, a larger scale of the turbulent spectrum. So uh, we, we can use this larger eddy simulation to, to also to gas liquid systems. So this uh, technique was first developed to, for a single phase system, but then in the recent years, uh, uh, also a lot of work was done in for multi-phase system, uh, especially to gas solid flows to extend this uh, methodology also for multi-phase system. And also some work has been done for gas liquid system, but this was done mainly to uh, low up to moderate gas velocity. Uh, and instead, in the work of uh, Francesco Maniscalco, we tried to use that for simulating also uh, heterogeneous regimes flows. The test case that we used for uh, this work was uh, the uh, bubble column of Luca Gemello. And then we were looking also for other uh, bubble columns. And uh, one interesting one that we found was the one investigated by McClure, which is a person who worked in the group of uh, David Fletcher. And, uh, and we found out that uh, published there are uh, results from this symmetrical configuration, which is a standard feed uh, for using the whole cross-sectional area to feed uh, the, the gas uh, inside the column. But then there is also a particular one, uh, an asymmetrical uh, injection. So basically just a half of the uh, total cross-sectional area was used to uh, let the gas enter into the system. And this can be particularly interesting to look at this, uh, at this uh, feed uh, type. Uh, then we were interested, of course, to look if uh, our simulations uh, uh, our LES simulations were, um, were consistent in terms of mesh quality. Uh, since we use the box filter uh, as filter from, uh, from the LES, what we wanted to, to, to be sure was that we, if we were um, using uh, uh, LES properly, so what we know is that uh, the size of the, of the cell should be uh, larger than the bubble size, more or less 1 to 0.2, 1 to 0.5 times of the bubble size. And then uh, what we want to do is to use LES in such a way to solve at least 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy field. Uh, and we check that we, uh, for our simulations to find which was the best uh, grid for using uh, LES. And at the end, using, uh, making this analysis and uses these uh, uh, requirements, uh, we were able to find out such mesh. Then I want to show you some results for this configuration. This is for the uh, asymmetrical configuration. And uh, in the results that, uh, uh, and, and what we were looking at was the uh, local uh, profiles of uh, volume fraction and local profiles of uh, liquid velocity. And uh, what we found out is that uh, uh, with, the R, with the RANS, uh, the standard K epsilon model, we were not able to capture these uh, asymmetrical peculiar profile that was developed inside this column. Instead with the uh, LES, we were able to do so. And uh, we tried different uh, LES uh, models that are formulated in the literature and the ones uh, that performs the best uh, for describing the subgrid scale uh, was the smagorinsky zhang uh, method. Um, then uh, uh, what we thought was that, okay, we are having this uh, uh, strange profile in the asymmetrical configuration because we have a clear lateral force that pushes bubbles uh, on, on one side instead of the other. Well, actually, we tried to run simulations with uh, uh, the lift coefficient. I'm sorry. And uh, basically, the results of this work show that uh, uh, when we use uh, uh, lift, uh, different lift coefficients or 
different uh, uh, lift correlations for uh, calculating the lift coefficient. Um, basically, the results get worse. <laughs> and uh, so uh, actually, the, we, it seems that it is best uh, use uh, uh, not using the lift force for simulate such system, but instead using uh, a, um, a LES uh, model for, uh, for the turbulence. What about the model performances? Well, of course, when we use runs, uh, the uh, computational time C uh, is lower than LES. And um, uh, actually, it's like uh, 30 up to 40% uh, more than runs uh, simulations. But uh, we are able to uh, obtain uh, good uh, results in terms of uh, uh, predictions, both on lower gas velocity and higher uh, gas velocity. Mm -hmm. okay, and, uh, Antonio, do you please yeah. uh, hurry up a bit because we are running out of time? Sure, sure. Okay, just to you. say, just to show you uh, these two uh, last quick uh, part. So we also mm -hmm. try to couple LES and PBM, and this was done by basically um, by basically uh, in the, in the simpler way. We basically calculated the turbulent dissipation rate using uh, the uh, flow field and the results given by the LES, and we use that. Uh, into the kernels for the homogeneous one and the heterogeneous regime that was uh, uh, written by uh, and, and, and formulated by in the work of Luca Gemello. And then what we obtained was very good prediction on both low uh, super gas superficial velocity and high uh, superficial velocity. Even with this very simplified approach, the predictions were much better. And then also a last part of the presentation was this uh, 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 testing of this methodology on uh, uh, a realistic system. Uh, this system is a, um, a square bubble column. Uh, the system is still with air and water, but was included also a bit of surfactant into, into the water. And uh, the superficial uh, velocity was moderate. And we were looking at the mass transfer of oxygen uh, into from the gas to the liquid. And this work was done in cooperation uh, by uh, University of Tarragona. And, uh, uh, and then we tried to use this LES PDM approach to describe the mass transfer. And uh, in terms of local profiles, we were really happy with, uh, uh, with the results that we obtained. In this case, it was actually uh, the, the effect of SDS was just uh, uh, well uh, simulated and well predicted only by uh, decreasing the surface tension. And, uh, and what we obtained was very good prediction in terms of uh, KLA. Uh, for different uh, uh, gas superficial velocities. And so let me skip this. So, okay, yeah. And this is just to say that something that it is very well known that uh, the effect of uh, uh, on the KLA KL was to uh, the, the presence of the surfactant decreases the uh, KL um, and increases instead the value of uh, uh, the, the superficial, the, uh, the interfacial area. So yeah, I, I'm at the end of the presentation. So in this work, uh, I, I, yeah, you can see the, um, the, the, the results that we obtained. So basically the blending approach is able to perform stable, reliable and fast simulation, high order schemes from the moments, and LES that outperforms uh, runs the traditional approach at an increase of the computational time. And what is still to do? Well, yeah, basically uh, what I said, so we, yeah, we, we uh, use LES, but uh, with PBM, but we haven't really modified coalescence and breakage kernel, which were derived under uh, the assumption on homogeneous iso isotropic turbulence. So these kernels must be modified in order to consider the turbulent information coming from LES. 
And then we need to apply proper, proper LEA severaging also on the interfascial forces term, uh, which is uh, more or less what is done also in other multi-phase systems like uh, in gas solid flows. And then we need to find a reliable approach to describe complex industrial system as was said by uh, the two speakers that talked before me. So um, sorry for uh, being uh, longer and thank you for uh, your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Antonio, for this uh, nice uh, presentation and these insights into numerical uh, simulation and uh, PBM modeling. So this was very interesting. I guess there are several questions. Even one is in the chat, but uh, due to the lack of time, I would um, suggest that we directly go to the next presentation and we keep our questions for the discussion. Or maybe you can also answer this uh, in, the, in the chat, maybe. So because we are a little bit late, I would li directly like to uh, overhand uh, to Martin uh, Obligado uh, in, from the group from uh, Alain Catelier from uh, the University of Grenoble in Alps. And uh, Martin will give us now some insights into opportunities to get particle size distributions uh, with experimental systems. And especially we will go to heterogeneous flows and uh, bubble columns and higher gas hold ups, what is very interesting as uh, Julia has already mentioned. So we are very excited about your presentation. Please go ahead, Martin. So do you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. So thank you, Michael. And thank you for inviting me to this nice um, series of um, seminars. So indeed, I am Martin Obligado. I work in Legi in Grenoble, France. And this is a work done with Alan Cartelier, who's also part of this talk and he's um, in the panel. And also Jan Mesui, a PhD student that just finished uh, a few months ago. Okay, so we already saw some nice discussions and we know that uh, bubble column reactors are widely used in chemical engineering. They are part of many important processes like hydrogenation, wet management and flotation units. And when, in our case, we will work with the simplest possible bubble column reactor in which we have a gas injected at the bottom of an initially stagnant fluid. So we can only control the flow rate of uh, gas that we inject. We will have a diameter D and a total height uh, H. And among the many problems present in these flows, we will focus on two. One is the problem of a transition from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous regime. You can see on this plot over here, as I said, the only control parameter that we have is the flow rate of gas that we inject. We can define a superficial gas velocity and with this flow rate and just using the section of the, of the column. And then we have three different regimes. We know that at low values of a superficial gas velocity, we are in the homogeneous regime, where we have like a quasi-linear relation between void fraction and the superficial gas velocity. Then there's an heterogeneous regime in which we have recirculation, the flow becomes very agitated and chaotic. And we also see that the holdup experiences a slower increase than in the homogeneous regime. And as usual, between both, we have a transition regime where we don't understand much what is happening. It's usually linked with bubble coalescence. And this is one of the points we want to make. First, you can see, I hope, I know videos in Zoom can be a bit uh, confusing, I hope, especially when you have uh, caps. <laughs> but on your left, you have an example of the of our bubble column in Legi, the homogeneous regime, and on the right of the heterogeneous regime. I hope it's not too confusing, uh, depends on the broadband. But well, this transition from left to right, from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous regime is usually linked to coalescence between bubbles. But in some recent works in particular, and Frederic discussed uh, a bit about this one, the one of Pedro Maximiano Raimundo, they observed that you can reach the heterogeneous regime without coalescence or at least without the presence of large bubbles in the heterogeneous regime. And one alternative mechanism already proposed in this work that I will discuss a bit further today is the agitation generated by clusters of bubbles that didn't, without coalescence, bubbles come from clusters and make this kind of transition. The other problem that was uh, nicely discussed by the presentation of PASS for uh, Julia and Sebastian is the problem of the upscaling from lab conditions to industrial reactors and all parameters like uh, the gas holdup, the liquid velocity, the gas velocity, and also the population and are problematic. Here is just to show that there are a wide family of different uh, scalings achieved uh, with the uh, bubble columns and different laws. 
well, we usually propose power loss, but we have different exponents, different results. So there's a lack of consensus in which are scaling loss, even for lab conditions. And it's a very important and open question uh, how we can make uh, extrapolate this loss to industry conditions. And um, these are just some of the results we propose. So the second objective, the first is to, of this talk is to try to characterize the transition or understand if it can be due to the presence of clusters. And the second is try to have experiments in well-controlled conditions and discuss, can we make it better in terms of these um, scalings? So for this, we have uh, two strategies. The first, uh, we will discuss some results done by um, Legis, uh, by Alain Cartelier and the uh, uh, IFP with uh, Frédéric, in which uh, columns with different sizes with diameters ranging from 15 centimeters to three meters in similar conditions, this means fixed bubble size distribution. So approximately the same kind of distribution with no coalescence, different values of diameter, superficial gas velocities that range on the same range for all uh, bubbles. Gas injection is uh, homogeneous. And then we will always work in the quasi developed uh, region of the flow. But then the second part is we try to go, to go a, little, a bit further. Also, well, Frederick mentioned that we have this new doc Pro. So the idea is that now we can have a void fraction of mobile size from classical optical probes. We will also use a Pavlov tube, which is some sort of pitot tube that allows us to measure the liquid velocity in both directions. But finally, we can have a, well, I'll try to show that we can have reliable gas velocity statistics thanks to uh, the new Doppler optical probe that, you used, that we used on this work. Okay, so as I said, um, part of the talk will concern control experiments in similar bubble columns. And these are experiments done during uh, Pedro PhD. I will use them as a benchmark to show the results with the Doppler probe. So there are four different um, bubble columns in which uh, they use the same uh, measurement techniques. Phi refers to the diameter, so phi 150. It's uh, 15, well, 150 millimeters of diameter up to 3000. They all have similar injection with similar porosity and they are all working on the heterogeneous regime. So we have this nice setup of different columns working on the heterogeneous regime. And we will focus in the 400 millimeters case in which we rebuild a bubble column in the G just to explore what, just to be able to control and explore the transition from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous regime. So uh, this particular column in which will be based uh, most of the talk is uh, three meters high. It has um, 40 centimeters of diameter. We can reach uh, superficial gas velocities up to 25 or even 30 centimeters per second. We have a plate in which we have uh, 352 injectors to have homogene uh, homogeneous um, injection. and there's almost no coalescence. I will get back to this um, in a minute. So the column has three meters uh, height. The probe is located at 1.45 uh, meters where we check that the flow is quasi fully developed. We have um, in stagnant conditions, two meters of water. Then as I said, we can inject uh, the gas up to in a superficial gas velocity up to 30 centimeters per second or 25. The liquid phase is obtained with a Pavlov tube that uh, allow us to get um, the mean and the standard deviation of um, velocity. And then on a first step, we check the injection conditions and the properties of the flow with standard conical probes. This involves the classical conical probe that works can give some estimation of velocity with uh, the wetting and therefore of the cord. And then the one that Frederick also showed on his talk is the double conical probe in which uh, using a correlation technique, we can get the Sauter diameter of the bubbles. And you can see how oh, these are micro machined, small probes. So the first thing we want to check is uh, the injection of the flow using the conical probe. You can see on your left, the homogeneous regime, on your right, the heterogeneous regime. This is the gas holdup, the radial um, variation of the gas holdup for different uh, heights. And um, we can observe that in this, well, between, we are always between two and five uh, diameters in terms of height, so always in the quasi fully developed region. 
and we can see that um, the profiles tend to collapse in both regimes. So this just is good to see that our column in this regime and the gas injection is homogeneous. Then for coalescence, so this to get, uh, of course, to get the core, we will use the velocity and the size of the bubbles measured by the, by the probe. Then we can make it better with the Doppler probe that gives more reliable measurements of the velocity on the heterogeneous regime. But so what we wanted to see is these are the PDF of a uh, core for different um, heights, this time from 1.6 to 6 diameters. Again, homogeneous on your left, heterogeneous on your right. And we can see that the PDF of size do not change with, and with the height, this suggests that, okay, maybe very close to the injection, we may have some coalescence breakup, very complicated uh, dynamics. But in this region, um, there don't seem to be coalescence or strong changes of size and for our particle PDF. Just to go a bit uh, further with this, so of course the previous results are with the optical, the single conical probe where we can get a shorter diameter as you see on your left. We also compare our results with the one found by Maximiano Raimundo PhD and both left and right. And the right is just to get a confirmation, the measurements with the double probe. And we see indeed that the size of the particles of the bubbles is between six and eight millimeters. So it's violet and blue for our bubble column. So it seems that we have what we wanted, a nice bubble column with no coalescence, and no homogeneous injection, and a developed um, um, a region where we have developed uh, flow. But we need to have some, if we want to have a gas velocity measurements, we need a new probe. We know that this kind of probes that works with the wetting tend to fail when we are in the heterogeneous regime. And that's why working with A2PS, the probe was actually developed by A2PS and it was, we did some tests in LEGI that you can see in this recent uh, work in chemical engineering science. So this new probe, instead of working with the wetting works with um, a Doppler effect. So we, it doesn't need any calibration. You can see here a scheme of it. There's a probe, it's emitting a, a single band laser and so it will emit the laser when it reaches uh, the interface water air, we will have some reflection and this, re this interaction between the emitted light and the reflected one will generate some interference fringes that can be related to the Doppler effect and the velocity in this way. So we can actually get from the frequency of the Doppler that we see the velocity of the bubble. So we have the optical fiber, we have an approaching interface and we can deduce the velocity normal to such interface. This is not a new idea. It has been proposed before and some work with the cleaved optical probes. You can see many different works even since the, the 80s. But uh, the key innovation by A2PS was to propose to use optimized sharp tips like the one that you can see here, thanks also to recent advance in micro nano fabrication. So these optimized sharp tips allows to have accurate phase detection and also Doppler signals of significant uh, amplitude. We can see that uh, here, well, for, I suppose most of you work with optical probes, but this is a, a standard uh, signal, voltage signal of an optical probe. Zero means that we are in water, in how this probe is made. 0 0.8 volts means that we are on air. So we have a nice uh, dynamics between air and water. We can detect phases. So already with this, we can have a gas time and arrival time of the bubbles and they use a local, local gas hold up because this is well resolved in time. But I, I said we have both a good resolution of uh, phases, but also a good uh, Doppler effect. Actually, if we zoom on when the bubble is exiting the, the probe, as we can see over here, we have a very nice and clear Doppler effect from which with the equation that I showed you on the slide before, we can deduce the gas velocity. Then there are some selection criteria that we explore on the manuscript I showed before. The, we found that the most important selection criteria are how many periods we have on this Doppler effect and which is the homogeneity of this period just to avoid like accelerations or issues on, on this side. Then before going to this, sorry, we can put the probe like facing upwards or downwards. And we also shown that we can use this probe to have 
upward uh, moving bubbles or in the heterogeneous regime when we can have recirculation, we can also measure bubbles going downwards if we change the orientation of the probe. Okay, first to check that the probe is working fine, we check that the, well, maybe the simplest uh, test is the void fraction. This is still, I'm just showing the results for the bubble column in the G of the 40 centimeter diameter one. This is a comparison of the void fraction in which you can see in, in red, the classical conical probe and in blue, the new Doppler one. They have different sensing lenses, different shapes. So we don't expect these two parameters to be exactly identical but we see they are very close. The maximum relative difference is about 5% on this area over here, but we have very good agreement between both probes in the phase detection up to 35% uh, void fraction. I'm not showing it here, but for us, and what we can see it on the plot, the transition occurs between five to 10 centimeters per second from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous. So in both regimes, we have a very good agreement. Then, a second thing that we want to check is that uh, when we change the selection criteria, the number of periods then and the homogeneity among them uh, epsilon, results do not change uh, a lot. So on your left, you can see that we fixed the homogeneity and we tried different numbers of um, periods. On your right, we fixed the number of periods and we changed the homogeneity. And we can see, of course, there's very small differences, but both in the homogeneous and in the heterogeneous regime, we can get nice and well-converged PDF of velocity, and they don't change a lot with this selection criteria. So it seems that within a reasonable range, the output of this uh, probe is very robust. And then just to get into the results that we can get with these new gas measurements, we also measure uh, the liquid velocity with a Pavlov tube. We can also, so, the optical probe allows us to get uh, the gas velocity, the local gas holdup, but we can also get the liquid velocity for our further considerations that I will show just now. So this is the mean of the liquid velocity. This is the standard deviation. The Pavlov tube allows us to measure upwards and downwards velocities, so we can get all the statistics that we need for these cases. So for the liquid velocity, we want to check if instead, if indeed the flow is uh, self-organized and we can start making some scalings and consideration based on the autosimilarity of the flow. These are results for uh, Maximiano Raimundo PhD and publications uh, made in IFP, IFP bubble column, sorry. So on your left, you can see the gas hold up normalized with the value at the center. On your right, and the liquid velocity, all columns and also the fits proposed by uh, Anforé. And looks like between 2.5 and 3.75, we have a quasi fully developed region where things seems to be um, self similar. There's a flow reversal, as we know, in the heterogeneous regime at around 0.7, 0.8 uh, diameters. And so there's good agreement between the formulas proposed in the literature by Schweitzer and Fauré and our results. It is also news that now, and these are results for the gas velocity in the 40 centimeters of column. So these are different velocities at the same height and for gas. You can, so this is the radial evolution of the gas velocity. And we can see that for different superficial gas velocities, it also collapses to the same curve. We are always normalizing with the value at the center line. So now we can also have access to the gas velocity in, well, for our recent results, these are results from the last uh, months, only for the 40 centimeters bubble column. Of course, it would be nice to extend it to different diameters as we just saw before. So with all this, what we want to do is to propose some uh, scalings. So we can measure the cord, we can measure the gas velocity, the liquid velocity. Can we make some conclusions in terms of um, upscaling of bubble columns? So we found that it is possible to propose some liquid velocity scaling with some basic uh, considerations. The first one is we will work. So all the bubble columns I show, they have a high uh, aspect ratio. And also they have a fully developed region. So within this fully developed region, we have only one length scale, which is the column diameter D. We saw that the flow becomes self-similar, so we can uh, neglect uh, the column height uh, H. And then 
in an analogy with uh, buoyancy driven flows like uh, convection and so on, we can write a balance between the inertial terms of our flow and the buoyancy, which is quantified by delta rho over rho. Well, delta rho is the change of, uh, of density at the uh, well, defined which in um, both uh, phases, sorry. So if you write this, it's very simple to find that uh, the liquid velocity should be equal to GD delta rho over rho with an exponent uh, one and a half. So this is just a consideration that you can get equating the buoyancy with inertial terms. This is also equivalent that we have a free fall velocity of a fluid particle with density rho plus delta rho uh, sinking or cleaning up surrounding fluid at density rho. But then, as we said, the only relevant large scale parameter is the emitter D. We can rewrite delta rho over rho and rescale it using the diameter. It's actually, you can see here is a straight uh, forward formula, but it implies that delta rho over rho will just go as the mean gas hold up. So all these considerations is just to say that we expect that uh, the velocity should scale as GD one and a half. Several works was proposing this uh, scaling, but GD times epsilon one and a half. This is the scaling that we get from these um, considerations. So to test uh, this uh, scaling, we did uh, we looked for all the papers that we found in which they report both the liquid velocity and um, the gas uh, hold up. So we can see these works over here that includes the works done in IFP that they were showing at the beginning. So these are all the values of the gas hold up as a function of the superficial gas velocity. And as I said, they report both gas hold up and liquid velocity. And we can see that if we normalize the liquid velocity reported by the scaling that we propose, when we reach the heterogeneous regime for large values of superficial gas velocity, they tend to collapse. This is a linear scale. So they tend to collapse onto a plateau. So it seems that uh, this scaling is pertinent, at least for available data. You can see also here the liquid velocity versus the scaling GD epsilon one and a half, in which actually it seems to work fairly well. So this scaling seems to be pertinent for bubble columns, several bubble columns in different conditions in the heterogeneous regime. But then we try to go, uh, try to go a little bit further. We have the results from the optical Doppler probe. So we have access to the liquid and also to the gas velocity. And we also have the mean values and the standard deviations. And as, as I said, also we can put the probe up and down so we can actually get the total mean gas velocity, including reversals in the heterogeneous regime. And you can see that uh, the green curves corresponds to the mean and the standard deviation of the gas velocity. It's always normalized with the GD epsilon. And you can see that they all tend to a plateau. So it seems that this scaling is also pertinent for the gas velocity. So in the next step, we looked for publications in which they also report the local wave fraction and uh, the gas velocity for different conditions. These are the conditions that we found. And okay, and we also see that everything tends to a plateau. There's a bit more of dispersion, but as we saw, to measure the gas phase is more complicated. So there are different uh, collection techniques, but still we see that all data tend to a plateau and seems to also work. The scaling seems to also work for the gas velocity. Just uh, a few considerations to conclude. We try to get some understanding and try to, so we have these values, our scaling depends on the density variations in our mixture. So what we did was to try to identify also thinking in terms of, we do have this transition, we don't have coalescence. The question will be, do we have clusters of bubbles? For that, we used the bottleneck tessellations 1D because we have the signal from the probe. So a bottleneck tessellation will just define a bottleneck cell saying that it's the space closest to each bubble. So we have a time series with different events. We will end up with a lot of uh, time intervals that corresponds to these Voronoi cells. Then we can just do statistics and we can compare with the random Poisson processes. Um, but this is a well-established technique, at least in turbulent flows, in particular laden and also in metallurgy and biology. 
So we can actually detect clusters using these simple statistical considerations. And this is what we did. So again, now we are showing only results for the 40 centimeter bubble column. We have a PDF for different superficial gas velocities. And we can see that the PDF is always different from the one of a random process. We can relate this to the presence of clusters. And indeed, a way of quantifying clustering will be the standard deviation of these same distributions. So this value sigma, we can say that the bigger it is, the more clustering we have. 0.71 corresponds to no clustering. And we see that we all, always have clustering. And in the heterogeneous regime, in the transition, we just make a jump and we get stronger clustering. We never have a perfect uniform and uniform and non-cluster flow in the homogeneous regime. This may suggest that injection is not optimal at the low superficial gas velocities. But there's clear evidence of clusters. So what we can do now is, so we have, uh, we know which bubbles belong to clusters. We have the size, we have the gas, so we can start doing condition statistics of velocities inside in clusters. And of course, if we have clusters, we also have our voids. So we condition the statistics by, by the instantaneous concentration. And we found out that bubbles within clusters move uh, much uh, faster than, well, move uh, quite faster than in the, the average distribution. Bubbles in voids move um, slowly. So we were able to do this. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to show, once we have this, we can also, measure uh, which are the relative velocities, the average relative velocity. So just we can have the raw relative velocity with the gas and the liquid phases. We found these are the results. You should, um, we can concentrate on UR from direct measurements, which is we have the difference between the gas and the liquid. We see that it tends, when, again, when we normalize it with the GD epsilon, it tends to this uh, constant value, but we can also, try to write all the contributions to re relative velocity arising from different uh, and dense and the void regions of the mixture. We will have a lot of, so this is a long equation which we just consider how many particles belong to clusters and the relative velocity. We have voids and we also have bubbles which are between clusters and voids in intermediate regions. So we get this very long equation. We can evaluate with our data each different coefficient. And we found indeed that the relative velocity tends to a value similar to the one that we found here. So well, we're happy with these results. I'm a bit out of time, I think. So um, with this, we ended up uh, proposing a possible fast track mechanism. We took this from particle and turbulent flows. But the idea is in the bubble column, we have these very large, probably vertical elongated structures. We don't really have an insight on how do they look. But bubbles are mainly located between these vortices. But for bubbles will channel between vortices because they will preferentially pick up the side of eddies with a, an upward motion because well, they will try to minimize the relative velocity. So because, well, just to minimize the drag force. So the main result is that uh, particles will move uh, faster upwards than, than in average because particles will try to tend to move faster within this um, fast track mechanism. And this has also been documented in particular and turbulent flows. So that's all for me. We, just to conclude briefly, we show that we can reach the heterogeneous regime without coalescence, seems to be related. We propose that it's related to the presence of clusters. We have this new Doppler probe that allows to measure gas velocities and cords, and therefore cords even in the heterogeneous regime. This helps us to find a scaling that works for the liquid phase and also performs fairly well for the gas phase. And there's, this opens a lot of perspectives trying to better characterize this uh, mesoscale, these cluster structures. And of course, check these last results for different column diameters and so on. And thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Martin, for this uh, nice presentation and your insights into opportunities uh, to get uh, experimental uh, information about uh, bubble size distributions and especially these uh, new promising uh, probe. And uh, 
yeah, we have some two, let's say two minutes uh, for, for questions, if you have any questions. Uh, but there's right now no question um, in the FNA section. So maybe I can, can add something. So first of all, I would like to comment that uh, uh, we have used this um, uh, needle probe several times also in, uh, in industrial systems in, on organic solvents under high temperatures and pressures, and it works uh, quite well. So this is a recommendation from, from me, from my side, uh, to, to use this, especially in, in industrial systems. One problem that always arises is uh, that you assume more or less that you have a, a spherical shape of the bubbles, right? But if we look now in these heterogeneous flow regimes, there you will have, of course, uh, not really uh, spherical systems, uh, bubbles. You will have uh, all kinds of shapes. Can you comment on that? How is the, the probe handle this, this problem that the shapes are not uh, always uh, spherical? Yes, indeed, we can. So what we're getting with the Doppler probe is uh, the cord, no, the average mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. vertical uh, diameter. That's why, as what Frederick shown, and we also report some results, we can use the double probe. Mm -hmm. Using correlation, you can estimate um, the horizontal cord too, and you can reconstruct altogether. Mm -hmm. It's true that there are some endoscope uh, systems that are a bit intrusive and very hard to operate in the heterogeneous regime. I know you use them too, but yeah, it's a problem in terms of population. And we can now now we can access easily the vertical cord. Um, thanks to this correlation technique, we can also get some idea of the horizontal cord of the bubbles. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's a relevant problem. I agree. Very good. Okay, thank you. And another question is related to the correlation you showed us uh, that it works quite well. This was for water, air, right? So you have not uh, transferred this correlation so far to other material systems. Yes. Like so, mm -hmm. Yeah, all our results are okay. Water from mm -hmm. Grenoble. It's a bit <laughs> yes, of course. Good to mention <laughs> that because it's extremely ex <laughs> important. <laughs> we have seen that for Yes. <laughs> our water and well, our air is also special too, a bit polluted, but yeah, <laughs> only water and air from... <laughs> from Grenoble, yeah. That's yeah. good to mention because we really know that this is a very crucial point. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you so much. If there is no thank further uh, questions so far, then I would like to thank you again for the uh, nice uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, let's thank all the presenters for their uh, very nice presentations. I guess uh, we get uh, very, very nice uh, insights into um, the scent of knowledge now for, um, for population balance modeling. And uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to give you the opportunity um, to ask um, more questions, give comments. Is there anything you would like to address to, to our presenters or to this topic in general? Then uh, please um, write your questions or comments uh, into the chat maybe. Even our presenters, of course, uh, do you have something you would like to address? Maybe also to the questions that we have in the Q&A section. I have a question and a remark on the presentation of um, Martin and also of Antonio. And, uh, it's a very open question. And, uh, would like to know uh, what people uh, think about that. Uh, if we look at the population balance framework, uh, we it's based on the uh, turbulence modeling, very simple, with a uh, assumption of isotropic homogeneous turbulence based on single phase flow turbulence. In fact, uh, the of theory. But we we see that in the dense flows we have uh, turbulence and flow that is completely different, as uh, seen by Martin. We have clusters. We have uh, structures of uh, uh, between gas and liquid uh, that is completely different. And also, uh, I, remember, I remember some uh, measurements of the energy cascade by uh, IMFT, who shown that the slope was not a minus five over three uh, slope, but uh, they found another slope and so on. So, my question is. Uh, do we have to rewrite completely uh, the, the kernels of a breakage and and, and, and quadrants based on the new uh, uh, knowledge about the real turbulence in the uh, bubble flows, or can we uh, can we uh, just modify existing models uh, 
changing some parameters to to update this uh, knowledge. Uh, it's also the question of uh, Antonio about uh, using RANS or LES uh, framework. Uh, what do we have to change in there in terms of kernels when we change the knowledge we have about the real uh, turbulence inside this code? Yeah, yeah. I, I I was thinking about this 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 topic uh, uh, during the work of of Francesco, but then at the end uh, uh, we decided to use the, the, the quick way. Uh, so basically calculate the epsilon from LES simulations to get some uh, fast results. Of course, uh, also the evaluation of epsilon in, in, in of turbulent dissipation rate in LES simulations, it's kind of a tricky because this is not a quantity that is actually calculated. I mean, you have the uh, filtered velocity and then you have the subgrid model and uh, we tried to combine these informations to come up with a with a with a turbulent dissipation rate, and actually we used uh, the definition that we found out in the literature, but we are not fully convinced about about that. So, in my opinion, probably the 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 the, the next uh, uh, the next thing that can be done is to try to rewrite the uh, kernels uh, completely from. Uh, from 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 scratch, uh, but actually um, a few uh, work has been done on this. So especially in the community of liquid liquid system, uh, they try to uh, um, um, to write uh, coalescence and, and breakage kernels considering the whole turbulence spectrum. So not just considering. Uh, the, uh, the the particle being in the inertial range, but considering the uh, whole uh, um, uh, the whole turbulence spectrum. So the fact that eddies of different size, uh, uh, from the smallest to the largest scale, may uh, have an impact on the dispersed phase. And uh, um, these are based on the use of uh, some. Uh, um, turbulence spectrum that were uh, predefined in, for the shape. So basically, they used uh, a shape that comes from the uh, Pope and, and Davidson uh, work for the turbulence spectrum. And then basically uses a, a kinetic approach to consider the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, the, 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 the turbulence spectrum on the particle size. So this has been done for both uh, uh, coalescence and, and breakage kernel. But of course, uh, this means that uh, you complicate a lot uh, the, the expression and basically the expression of the kernels. And, uh, and so you got more parameters then to, to fit. So of course, uh, what what they see here is that uh, if we go to into the direction of uh, complicating the kernels to describe better the physics, then we end up with having uh, a much larger number of uh, parameters to be fitted with the experiments. Uh, instead, if we stay by using the kernels that we are using right now, that means that uh, we may fit less parameters. We have models with less parameters, but then we may come up in situations in which uh, you were showing before. So uh, from the experimental side, you have uh, a certain trend for, uh, uh, I don't know, medium uh, uh, bubble size versus, uh, versus conditions of uh, uh, flow rates, gas flow rates, and so on. And uh, uh, that trend may be not reproduced by uh, the current kernels. So um, I think that from the theoretical point of view, uh, a modification of the kernels must be explored in order to see uh, if with uh, much complicated uh, kernels, we are able to, uh, to get uh, results uh, uh, for describing such situation mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. this yeah. attempt mm -hmm. must be must be tried at least mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because if we use uh, errors on the resolution of, of the estimation of the turbulence 
And after we have to uh, use population balance models that uh, counter, uh, counteract these errors. It's, it's hard to be very difficult to use. I mean, uh, for example, we have models for the relative velocities between the bubbles, which are just depending on the dissipation rate on the homogeneous the tropic turbulence. If we see with uh, ex experiments from uh, Martin, for example, that the relative velocity between bubbles and so on is, does not follow at all what we believe yeah. from the initial theory. Mm -hmm. After you, we use this relative velocity, which is wrong, mm -hmm. and we use it for the kernels of uh, coalescence, for example. Mm -hmm. So we, we add uh, an error to another error in order to find uh, more or less uh, usable results. But uh, yes, at the end, uh, we still don't know if we should perhaps mm -hmm. rewrite. Mm -hmm. Turbulence, okay. or perhaps starting from LES, or I don't know what uh, mm -hmm. framework can uh, rewrite turbulence, rewrite uh, kernels from uh, uh, update uh, detailed knowledge of the turbulence itself in uh, the before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and and you are. Approach with a with a B zone, uh, this B zone approach was was quite promising. I guess it shows that that this goes in the right direction. So maybe this is another opportunity to get. Uh, of of course, it's not so yeah, physically. It nice, would be better to have. It's better. That's to have. really chemical engineering part. I, I yeah, 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 yeah. But but my don't understand what's inside. Well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so all the other participants, please uh, write questions or comments in the chat uh, if you want to, or in the uh, Q and A uh, section and uh, to participate to this discussion i'm sorry that you cannot uh, that you are muted and cannot uh, participate directly but with uh, um, the uh, chat you can can do please please feel free to do that and there was a the uh, hand from uh, alain cativier you would like to to add something or ask something yeah, just, uh, and it would be possible but uh, we don't I'm, hear you well. I'm sorry. It's it's very difficult to to understand because there are some some sound problems with your microphone, maybe. Sorry, it's di very difficult to understand. Maybe you can write it into the chat, Allah. <laughs> well, <it's true>. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, ah, Maria Zetnikova is uh, participating as well. Hello, Maria, but uh, she has not written the question now fully. Please uh, continue, Maria. And uh, Alain has a point uh, in the two-phase flow uh, community, the interfacial area transport equation has been developed, among others, by the Ishi team, Ishi and Zuba. So uh, what is the advantage of the uh, population balance uh, modeling over this approach? What do you think about that? I should probably answer this. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. probably. So, um, yeah, basically with the interfacial, uh, uh, yeah, what is the name? The interfacial uh, area transport equation. Basically, you are solving uh, for uh, just uh, two, uh, two moment uh, uh, equations. So you are considering a distribution in which uh, you have just one, uh, one node. So basically, you are accounting for uh, different uh, um, sizes uh, into the different uh, uh, into the different cell of the domain, but then the uh, actual distribution that you have inside one single cell of your computational domain is basically mono dispersed. So um, with that approach, uh, take into account the polydispersity, it's, uh, it's, it's um, I would say, uh, I mean, can be done, but it's much more complicated. So instead, when you are considering at least two nodes, so at least two groups of, of bubbles, at the end, you are able to, uh, to accommodate uh, better the, the size distribution because at least you are dividing the, the whole size distribution into two groups. So this is my understanding. I know that a lot of work has been done on this uh, uh, um, mono dispersed distribution that can change uh, from locally from point, point to point to, to, into the domain. 
but then uh, instead uh, considering a, an actual polydispersity, uh, so means that uh, for each computational cell you have, uh, uh, you may have bubbles with different sizes, it's, it's much better. And in terms of computational time, uh, is not, uh, uh, it's not that much uh, uh, affecting the, the simulation. So in my opinion, it is uh, always better to consider uh, um, uh, a size distribution. Uh, so at least two uh, nodes, two groups of, of, of bubbles. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. And Antonio, um, uh, right now, Lattice Boltzmann uh, the numerical simulations uh, come up uh, very strongly and they also go in the direction of uh, uh, PBM. Do you have any experiences with that already and, and some, some ideas? Well, not yet. Uh, actually, uh, I have one, <laughs> one <laughs> PhD student that, uh, that uh, wants to, uh, um, to, to, to go to uh, Canada, to a group in Canada, mm -hmm. in which they are working a lot hard on uh, Lattice Boltzmann uh, simulations, but actually uh, he's not uh, 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 lived yet because uh, he's waiting for the visa, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> okay. to, start, to start looking into that direction in order to use Lattice Boltzmann to investigate uh, uh, better the uh, mechanism of uh, collisions uh, uh, between uh, between uh, droplets within uh, bubbles so mm -hmm. that is Boltzmann in my opinion can be used for for that in order to bridge uh, to 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 uh, fill the gap between uh, uh, the mesoscopic and microscopic information and the macroscopic uh, scale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so okay. this can be a promising tool uh, at least for uh, what has been done in the in the years uh, in the recent years for the for on the lattice boltzmann community so mm -hmm. it's that the, the the tool seems to be ready to be used for doing uh, simulations of uh, of this uh, phenomenon mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a question from uh, Maria Zetnikova from uh, 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 Czech um, um, Academy of Science, and uh, she's asking in your mass transfer measurement with SDS, uh, did you obtain any foaming? Would it be possible to simulate the foaming? Another question to Antonio. <laughs> yeah, this is actually a, a very <laughs> nice question. And yeah, I mean, the, the concentration that were investigated were, were very low. So there was no foaming for these systems. Uh, the effect that we, that we had and we, and we saw was uh, only on the surface tension, so the decrease of surface tension. So an effect of the uh, surfactant on the uh, surface of the different bubbles. Uh, but not uh, uh, actually having uh, uh, foam. And would it be possible to simulate the foaming? Uh, in principle, yes, but uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, it really depends on uh, uh, what we want to simulate. So if you mean the, uh, the formation of, uh, um, of uh, uh, bubbles or foams, so air entrapped by uh, a thin liquid film, uh, probably with uh, uh, large scales, with large scale simulation, that type of information uh, cannot be achieved, cannot be reached, probably that level of detail. Uh, but with uh, um, Lattice Boltzmann simulation, I think that if you going to, to see uh, uh, that level of the detail of the macro on the macro scale and the mac on the micro scale, uh, that level of detail, I think that it is possible to simulate the formation of, of forms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, then we have another question from uh, Mariana Torres. Uh, she's working in emulsion polymerization. Uh, I, uh, for example, gets liquid mass transfer uh, though some experiments I have observed that um, RP changes in function of the type of hydrophil and the agitation speed. So my question is, do you think uh, these parameters should affect the size of the bubbles pumped into the liquid phase? Probably a question to all of us. So...
the type of hydro foil, hydro foil, type of hydro foil and the agitation speed. RP changes and functions of the type of hydro foil and the agitation speed. Ah, do you mean, are you, are you, um, I guess the question is not totally clear for us. I don't know if anybody is uh, getting it fully. My hydrofoil, I mean impellers, okay? So what RP is um, the radius of the... the what is or? RP? What, what do you mean with RP, Mariana? Is it the power number? Rate of polarization. Ah, okay. The rate of polarization. If you change the impeller, you change completely the dissipation rate inside the reactor. So mm -hmm. you can change anything. In fact, when you change uh, the impeller type due to the difference of power number, at least. So yeah, the I process change. is limited by the by the gas the size of bubbles or anything else. Normal to change the uh, rate of conversion due to the change of interfacial area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course everything is changed by the size distribution by, by the energy dissipation rate in the system. And another point, maybe you would like to address this, is uh, also uh, the separation from the sparger is uh, changing if you change uh, the uh, stirrer speed. So there are many, many uh, influences on, on, on bubble size distribution. Then of course, all the whole, whole uh, multi-phase uh, fluid dynamics. Okay, so um, you, please add the, the question again if you have uh, other uh, points that, that you would like to address. There is one further question from Christian Chetracek. Sorry, uh, is uh, any high order reliable, realizable scheme in ANSYS Fluent implemented? Uh, yeah, this is an answer for me. Uh, this is mm -hmm. a question for me. Um, yes. No, actually, no, there is no uh, implementation available uh, for, for that. The work that we have done for higher order realizable scheme was done for in, um, in, in open form, in which we can really code uh, what you want. Mm -hmm. Instead, in, uh, in ANSYS Fluent, it's, it's tricky, and we haven't really tried to implement that in, uh, in, in ANSYS Fluent. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Sandra Ovalio, also from Czech uh, Republic. Uh, how feasible is a correction of the kernel functions currently used for coalescence and breakup? Hmm, I guess this is a very, very general uh, question. Um, yeah, I, the, the question is general and it mm -hmm. depends on what you mean with correction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in principle, as I said, uh, um, this is this is an approach that has been already done for uh, uh, considering the whole uh, turbulence spectrum. So uh, <laughs> these kernels used for liquid liquid systems were corrected in order to take into account the influence of the whole turbulence spectrum. So um, I think that this can be this can be done also for kernels used by the gas liquid community, which are, by the way, uh, the, the very same. So um, most probably just a few attempts must be a few attempts must be must be done in this mm -hmm. direction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess that's why we are together here. Yeah, because you would like to find out how feasible it is and and where are the critical points and uh, what further research have to be done in future. Um, yeah, there's one uh, question from um, Pascal Pito, and uh, he says, thanks for all those discussions. Just an easy question at the end. How do you see the relationship between the PBM approach and our traditional KLA approaches? What to take for A, for the specific surface uh, area? Yeah, of course, this is a, a good point. That's that, that's what all we of we hope at the end, right? That at the end we can uh, calculate um, the specific surface area much more reliable. And uh, yeah, would would someone uh, else would uh, add something here to this point? Yeah, I guess I, I can go if you. Want. Yeah. Yeah, in the um, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, the, the point here is that with with the correlation, with global correlation, 
you have to carry out uh, experiments uh, for uh, each single uh, each single uh, device that we want to scale up uh, or optimize. While instead with the PBM approach, in principle, you are able to use models to to do to do so, and uh, you still have local informations. Uh, but at the end, you can use that tool also to predict global uh, quantities if you are interested in. So, um, of course, that, that the problem is the, the validation of the model. Of <laughs> so it's probably shifted to one part. But of course, if you are able to uh, use uh, first standardized experimental uh, techniques and methods uh, uh, so you are able, if we are able to use such standardized techniques, and then uh, if we are able to improve our models, we are going to obtain at the end a tool that help us to uh, predict uh, this situation also for very different uh, uh, geometrical configurations. So steel yeah. tanks, uh, uh, bubble columns, uh, airlift, uh, whatever. Yes, thank, thank you. I, I, I guess this is directly related to the next question um, from uh, Amir Mahdi. How do you see the possibility of extracting information for kernels using high resolved uh, volume of fluid or Lagrangian simulations on smaller scale? I guess uh, that would be, of course, very, very nice. But uh, as soon uh, as, as long as we don't know the physics uh, behind that exactly, then of course, uh, even the numerical simulation will not help, unfortunately, because uh, yeah, the model is only as good as, as uh, the values you put into the, the model. And uh, from this point of view uh, today, there was a very, very important um, comment from Julia Hofinger in her uh, presentation. And this will keep me awake the next, the next re uh, nights, I'm quite sure. She mentioned, that the uh, surface tension is not enough to predict the bubble size distribution. And I guess this is a very, very important point. And this is also related to your comment, Ami Amadi. So as long as we not, do not know what, what is these maybe additional physical or chemical, however, factor that influences bubble size distribution, we will not be able to do numerical simulations for that or, or not for several systems. Does May I add to that? Yes, of course. Um, I do think that um, such simulations have value in terms of looking at the breakage mechanisms and what scales we have to expect. Uh, and that would, for instance, be a potential way towards a workflow so that we say, okay, we expect that size range. That's why we use those methods for measurement or for whatever. As has been nicely illustrated by the colleagues, we don't have the universal way of looking into our system. So that might be an option of doing that dance. And the other thing is the initial um, sizes are always also a problem at the Spartans. Antonio has suffered from yeah, that yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there we have seen benefits. And that, that is a, one aspect where we can get a bit of information. But mm. as you said, <laughs> I will keep you awake. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah, so, so even it would be even very helpful to know uh, under which uh, circumstances are our models um, usable and reliable. and. Uh, for what kind of systems is it critical? And we have to be careful here, yeah, for example, water ethanol. Why is this uh, water ethanol system so difficult to predict? Does anybody has an answer for this? <laughs> physical chemicals, physical chemicals, uh, people know, know that, but uh, it's, it's not in the kernels. They talk about zeta potential and electrostatic forces at the interface and so on. So they explain yeah. why. Uh, surface tension is not uh, sufficient to describe coalescence. But the question is, okay, but when once we, we know that from a microscopic scale, how do we upscale it to a model of, uh, model of, model of coalescence? So I think physics is more or less known, but yeah. now uh, we have to, to, to write the models. Uh, and, yeah, and what do you do for the voodoo systems when it's messy, when we have also fine <laughs> particles and so on? So I, yeah. there are probably a different approaches depending on how much we know. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's a lot of interactions and uh, electrochemical uh, uh, properties, for example, are also not taken into account so far. So I guess there are a lot of points. And I would like to, um, because we're coming to the end, and I would like to uh, end uh, with, a, with a slide, that uh, brings us a little bit to further opportunities, maybe. I guess we have all seen together um, today that there are still a lot of open questions. We have 
wonderful possibilities so far and we are very strong so far, but there are still several open questions. And uh, for me, it was very nice to see today that uh, uh, we, we probably all have to work together to, to solve these questions uh, across uh, Europe. And uh, so um, the idea that came up in our working party and uh, that I would like to propose now and uh, where I would like to invite also other working parties is uh, to set up a kind of European network on uh, population balance uh, modeling where we collect um, partners who have some uh, demands uh, from industry. Here are some examples, properties of material systems. So what kind of properties do you have in, in, in industry and uh, where are the most uh, interesting questions? Uh, what are your operation conditions? What are the dimensions, uh, reliable upscaling and downscaling? Uh, prediction of energy consumption, I guess, is an important point. And also um, just data for validation of own uh, numerical simulations would be probably helpful. And of course, industry, I guess, is always looking for young professionals. And this can be provided uh, from academia. So uh, we are um, uh, producing a lot of experimental data. We are uh, performing modeling, as you have seen, experimental equipment. We can provide computational power for numerical simulations. And we have these PhD students, and it's a win-win situation to bring them together. And uh, the question is, maybe we can uh, try to set up such an um, international uh, or European first European network for multilateral collaborations and uh, joint uh, applications, even EU applications maybe, and uh, also to um, strengthen bilateral co collaborations between academia and industry. So this is uh, what I would like to propose at the, at the end. And of course, this is something that should be uh, uh, overarching um, the working parties. Because if you think, and I have just uh, written down the, the, the working parties that comes immediately into my mind, there are of course more. So agglomeration, chemical reaction, engineering, crystallization. This is a group of Daniele Machizio. He's a chair of this working party. And uh, the, the mixing, um, uh, Joel Aubin, I'm quite sure, uh, might be interested also, of course, our multi-phase flow working party. So this is definitely a, a cross-working party uh, question that we address here. And uh, maybe it would be interesting to bring um, yeah, the people together and uh, to work on that um, in, in the next, uh, in, in the near future uh, to come um, faster to, to more reliable results here. And so that's my, my suggestion. And if you're interested in that, then of course, uh, please um, uh, contact uh, me. And uh, I will collect all, um, all uh, people who are interested in that. And uh, as you probably know, there will be an, another uh, conference on uh, population balance modeling in Lyon, uh, May 9 to 11. And I guess it would be a very nice opportunity to follow up there our discussions and uh, to maybe make this more um, uh, concrete, to bring this uh, into play, um, how to, to work uh, together across Europe um, in this field of, of, of research. And uh, yeah, any, any comments or uh, questions to this point? I guess it goes, everybody gets hungry. <laughs> in the meanwhile, and it was a long morning <laughs> with a, a lot of discussions. <laughs> So maybe I can just uh, leave you with this, with this idea and uh, with this uh, outlook to the next conference uh, and opportunity to come together. Okay, good, yeah, as mentioned, I guess everybody is, uh, is uh, hungry and would, so we should like, uh, we should come to, to an end maybe. Um, so I would uh, like to thank all the uh, presenters uh, once again. Thank you very much for your very nice uh, discussions and uh, presentations. And of course, also uh, many thanks to all the participants. We had about uh, um, more than at, at, the, the, uh, at the peak time, more than 100 participants and uh, uh, still uh, 80 participants uh, right now, no, 50 participants by now due to lunch probably. So um, I'm very happy and uh, satisfied with this meeting and uh, thank you so much for uh, your participating and the nice and uh, fruitful discussions. And I hope that we all will see us again 
uh, soon at uh, this conference or another opportunity. Corona is hopefully more or less over so that we will hopefully come uh, more often together now in future. So thank you so much uh, for this. Um, to all speakers, participants, and of course, also the EFCE, and especially Martin for the excellent organization again. And another opportunity, by the way, is our international symposium on multi scale, multi phase process engineering in uh, September. So, following up, maybe the population balance conference. Okay, thank you so much once again. And if there are no further important points, then I would like to hand over maybe to Martin to close the session. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Michael, for the managing this webinar. Just to remind you that the series continues and tomorrow you have got another webinar on membrane engineering and also next week. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.